Good morning once again to our US viewers and good afternoon to those in Europe. Welcome back for day two of the EU Defense Washington Forum organized by the European Union delegation to the United States and Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. My name is Neymar Aut and I'm excited to be back as a moderator as we continue our conversations on transatlantic security and defense. Again, to give our event a true transatlantic vibe, I'm joining you from our studio in Tallinn, Estonia. Many of our speakers are in Washington and elsewhere in the States, some are in Europe. So it is a truly global conversation, truly transatlantic conversation between Europe and, and the United States that we are starting today again. Yesterday, we discussed some of the most pressing issues from the big picture strategic outlook, hybrid challenges coming from Russia, also security challenges from China, and how to best address emerging and disruptive technologies. In case you missed any of it yesterday, you can find a recording on the EU in the US YouTube page. Today, our speakers will discuss another range of key topics like security implications of the climate change, including in the Arctic, challenges in Africa, in the Sahel region, also EU, NATO, US cooperation, and more. And remember, you can find the full forum agenda and speaker information by scrolling down the page, and it is located below the video player on your screen. We also encourage all our viewers to participate in the forum's discussions. You can do so by asking a question to our panelists using the Ask Live Questions Here button at the center of the page and by using the hashtag EU Defense on social media. That's EU Defense with an S. All of today's conversations are on the record and will be recorded, same as yesterday. You can find all the recordings in one place on the EU in the US YouTube page. And kicking off today's conversation and setting the stage for what's to come today, I welcome now to our screens Rachel Elhos, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the CSIS's Europe, Russia and Eurasia program from Washington, D.C. So, welcome, Rachel. The floor, the screen is yours. I'm really pleased to welcome you to our first panel of the day on the Arctic and, in, and specifically security implications of climate change. I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. First, we have the Minister of Defense of Denmark, Tlina Bromsen. Minister Bromsen has, is a member of the Social Democratic Party and she has been Minister of Defense since June 2019. Our second guest is the Canadian Minister of Defense, Harjit Sajjan. He's been Minister of Defense in, since November 2015. I should note he has also served as both a soldier and a policeman, and that's a really well-rounded background for dealing with Arctic issues. I'd also note this is the first time we have a Canadian participant in this forum, which again is fitting for the Arctic. Finally, we have Jim DeHart, who's the U.S. State Department Coordinator for the Arctic, joining us. Jim is a career foreign service officer with broad experience in regional security, civilian military cooperation, and international negotiations. And he's been assigned on both sides of the Atlantic as well, to include at NATO headquarters in Brussels and in Turkey. So welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I want to begin by reflecting on this comp the composition of this panel, because I think it's really telling, as I said, for the topic. Our speakers today represent Europe and North America, as well as the North Atlantic and the Pacific Arctic. This shows the vastness of the issue and the importance of bringing a breadth of perspective when discussing Arctic issues. This is also a timely topic. Climate was, along with COVID and China, one of the so-called red threads or running themes of Biden's Europe trip. He hit climate at every stop. Moreover, we saw action at the G7, at the US-EU summit, and at the NATO summit in Brussels. All pledged to do their part to reduce emissions and several NATO and US EU working groups were stood up on climate. There was also agreement to cooperate on green growth and a pledge to retain the Arctic as a region of peace and stability. 
So with that introduction, I'd like to turn to each of you for brief opening remarks on these re recent engagements, and in particular to offer your respective countries' current approaches to the Arctic. Minister Bromson, let's begin with you. Thank you, Rachel. I'm with you here from Finland, where I'm meeting with my Nordic colleagues. We are here to discuss aggressive actions, among other things, something which is relevant for our topic here as well. Because the cold north is getting more and more attention from Russia and the rest of the world. An area the size of Alaska and California, with enormous distances, extreme weather condition, and most of the land covered, covered by a great ice cap. This makes the Arctic an extremely challenging place to operate in. But climate change is opening up the region. The ice is melting, neutral resources and new shorter shipping lanes appear. This has not gone by unnoticed to the world. Military and civilian activities are growing in the area, especially Russia is increasing its military presence. And we see an increased Chinese interest as well, the increased risk of escalation and misunderstanding as well. It is becoming extremely clear that climate change is deeply affecting our security policy and the other way around. Thus, the issue of climate change is not only a question of reducing our carbon footprint. It is also a question of safety and stability for the people in the region and in the world. In the end, it's about defending our free and democratic values, the foundation of the Western world. There's no doubt that climate change is the defining threat of our time. As one of just five countries with active coastlines, the Kingdom of Denmark has a big responsibility for the stability in the region. This is not an easy task in these challenging physical surroundings, but we are already present with a number of military cap capacities, and with new investments, we will improve our awareness by a lot. Together with the Greenland and the Faroe Islands, we will strengthen our ears and eyes in the region even more. For example, we will be able to secure a much stronger overview of the region with the increased use of drones and radars, along with better information and protection of interest. Because the truth is, the truth is, with an area this big, we don't, do not know everything that is going on. Just two weeks ago, Russian fighter jets violated Danish airspace. This is one of the Russian actions discussed here in Finland, but it could happen in the Arctic as well. And if we cannot see it, it is a threat to all of us. However, it's clear that we cannot secure the region alone. It is crucial that we work together with our close allies, that we share information and cover it closely. The key role of, of our defense is to ensure stability. At the same time, we also have an important job when it comes to reducing the military sector's carbon footprint. Denmark is a front leader when it comes to green technology. We have more jobs in green energy than in fossils. One of the leading producers of wind energy is the Danish company Westas. And the biggest shipping company and experts in clean shipping is the Danish company Mask. In the coming years, we will take our military on the same journey. I recently presented a new national action plan for green defense. The action plan co covers close cooperation with the private sector, and it will set a new ambitious green direction for Danish defense. We will focus on how to support green solutions and cut emissions, for instance, from fuel as a clear sign that we plan to deliver. The action plan covers many areas where I see great perspectives for joint efforts with NATO and EU too. We must join forces in meeting the new security and defense related challenge that follow from climate change. A cornerstone in our shared democratic value is our joint commitment to address climate change as a defining threat of our time. If we want to succeed, we must stand together and take action for the protection 
of our common values that we regard so highly. Freedom, democracy, peace, and for the safety and security for the future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Bromson. Let's go to Ms. Minister Sajjan next, please. Welcome. Great, thank you, uh, and good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to join uh, you alongside uh, Minister uh, uh, Bramson and Mr. DeHart for this very important discussion, and thank you uh, for inviting uh, Canada to this uh, discussion. Now, Den Denmark is an important ally and a like-minded partner for Canada on many issues, uh, including the value of NATO, the Arctic, and climate change. And Canada is very proud of the long-standing and highly integrated defense relationship that we have forged with the United States. Now, everyone here recognizes that climate change presents immediate and long-term security challenges. It is a threat multiplier that aggravates underlying tensions and worsens uh, existing sources of conflict. This translates, translates into a growing need for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief at home and abroad. And in Canada, we're facing added pressures on federal departments and higher operational demands on, demands on our military. And every year, we're, we're, we are responding to more and more natural disasters like storms, floods, um, and fires. And the thawing permafrost in the, in the high north and its effects on critical infrastructure poses challenges in Canada response to disasters um, in, in the north. Now, in the case of COVID-19 pandemic, it meant adopting the vaccine delivery plan to reach northern remote and indigenous communities um, before the thaw. Now, climate change affects the region's infrastructure as well, both uh, man-made and natural. Damage from floods, degrading permafrost can disrupt energy and water access and cause greater maintenance requirements for critical defense infrastructure, including the Canadian Armed Forces surveillance, uh, mobility and rapid response cap uh, capabilities. That infrastructure also supports continental defense, including NORAD operations, our which is our binational North American Aerospace Defense Command. Higher levels of activity in the region uh, introduce new threats such as damage to unique ecosystems, risks associated with increased movement of people and goods, and human-induced disasters. Now, global warming makes the Arctic more uh, open and accessible and more vulnerable to exploitation, competition, and other health and security threats. And in fact, as climate change, uh, technological uh, advancements, economic interests, and geopolitical competition converge, the Arctic has become more strategically important than ever before. State and non-state actors seek to share in the region's rich natural resources and strategic position. Now, though the Arctic has long been a region of peace and stability, more and more we are seeing security dynamics, uh, uh, greater security dynamics being played out. Now, some states are taking uh, a much more assertive uh, posture, like Russia, uh, using advanced military and dual use capabilities to operate uh, in through the Arctic. Now, Canada's Arctic territory encompasses 40% of our total land mass and 75% of our uh, country's uh, coastline. So it's a key to our national defense and security. But most importantly, the only way to defend and secure this area is to work alongside those who live in Northern Indigenous, Inuit and remote communities to make sure that our investments in the Arctic create economic opportunities that work for the communities who actually live there. Now, by building this resili resilience, we will bolster our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance activities, ensuring uh, robust search and rescue and other emergency response capabilities, and be able to respond effectively and efficiently to security demands in the Arctic. So that's why we regularly invite Arctic allies and, and, uh, and partners to participate in Operation Nook, which is our signature northern, um, uh, northern operation. We also work with Arctic, the Arctic Council and like-minded global partners to safeguard the rule-based international order and uphold regional governance in the Arctic. And at the NATO uh, Leader Summit, our Prime Minister announced Canada's proposal to host NATO Center of Excellence on Climate and Security. And we will work with NATO and our allies to establish this center. The center will facilitate the exchange of expertise along, among allies, build capacity to address the security implication of, uh, of climate change, and advance our efforts to lower the climate impact of our military activities. The work at NATO and the Center of Excellence will be complementary to Canada's own ambitious measures to reduce our car carbon footprint and meet our enhanced targets to decrease 
greenhouse gas emissions under the Paris Agreement. We also understand that climate change has disproportionate impact on women and girls, Indigenous communities and other vulnerable populations. Canada will ensure uh, the perspectives, needs and knowledge of these groups are heard and, and are reflected in our work. Now, as climate change makes our security environment even more uh, complex, Canada is rising to meet these challenges at home and abroad. Our Arctic and Northern policy framework uh, was, uh, was a collaborative effort of more than 50 government and Indigenous partners and offers a strategic vision, vision to guide our efforts over the next decade and beyond. And we will continue working with global community to keep pace and advance trust in the areas of mutual concern, including climate change, pandemic response, and upholding the rule-based international order. And above all, we will work with our international partners and allies to maintain uh, the Arctic as a region of peace and stability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. That was a great uh, introduction to the link between uh, climate insecurity and the interlocking implications, as well as the broad responsibilities, not just at the international level, but at a local and national level. And that's a thread I'd like to pull in the question and answer. Uh, but first, I would like to go to Jim DeHart uh, from the U.S. State Department for opening remarks. Jim, you have been involved in this topic uh, for directly for at least uh, the last year and a half, and you were instrumental in preparing Secretary Blinken for his recent participation in the Arctic Council meeting. How has the U.S. policy and position towards the Arctic and climate change specifically um, evolved over the last year, and, and where does it stand under the Biden administration? Yeah, Rachel, thanks so much, and thanks for the invitation. I appreciate the um, EU delegation in Washington and CSIS, including me here, uh, and great to be uh, together with um, uh, Ministers uh, Bromson and Sajjan, and, uh, representing two very close allies, both in the Arctic and, and well beyond. Uh, so um, in answering your question, uh, Rachel, uh, let me just back up quickly uh, a trip I just took to um, to Alaska uh, to consult with uh, our own citizens of the Arctic and uh, one of the Alaskans I met uh, talked about uh, being at a, a recent event seeing all the different reports uh, about the Arctic sort of laid out um, looking at the covers of these reports you know and seeing um, images of polar bears of ships of melting glaciers of, of ice uh, and um, security infrastructure uh, as well and sort of a reminder of of the uh, the the varied interests that we have uh, in the Arctic um, there are multiple dimensions uh, security very important but the economic dimension safety emergency preparedness science climate, we have a we have a variety um, of interests, and and we need a comprehensive diplomatic approach. Um, the Alaskan I met with, she also observed there were very few, um, if any, photos uh, cover shots of people uh, in the region, and so I think it's also a reminder that people do live there. We need to remember this, and while taking a comprehensive uh, diplomatic uh, approach to the region. Uh, we need to have the residents of the Arctic at the core of that approach and at the core of our considerations. Uh, the other thing uh, I would advocate for is, <clears throat> is a long-term approach. Uh, the Arctic uh, will be changing rapidly. It's warming three times faster than the global average, uh, but it won't uh, become immediately accessible in the next few months uh, dramatically or even years, but it's going to play out over decades. Uh, and we need to take a long-term perspective there. It's not something that democracies necessarily do instinctively uh, with their election cycles, uh, but the Arctic is a true strategic question that demands that sort of long-term uh, perspective. Uh, I was very pleased to see in the, the program for this event the reference to the interim national security guidance that was issued by President Biden in March and the great emphasis on working uh, in partnership with our with our close allies, our partners uh, across uh, the world. 
Um, another key theme in that strategic guidance is this connection uh, between what we do domestically and our foreign policy and ensuring that our foreign policy uh, delivers uh, for our citizens and also leveraging our strength at home uh, to be more effective uh, overseas. Uh, as the Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer mentioned yesterday, we are in a competition globally uh, with other systems and democracies must show that they can deliver for their people. And this is absolutely true uh, in the Arctic where um, communities face challenges uh, and uh, we need to tie what we do uh, in the foreign policy and security realm to the interests uh, of our citizens. So, so that's what we're doing. We're doing this in very close concert with our uh, great allies uh, and partners in the region. We're doing this through the Arctic Council and Rachel, you mentioned uh, the re recent ministerial that Secretary Blinken attended. Uh, it, was a, it was a great event. Um, Iceland had a terrific chairmanship despite the challenges of COVID. Uh, we had solidarity at the ministerial among the Arctic states uh, in the form of an agreed declaration and an agreed strategic plan to guide the work of the council in the next 10 years. Uh, and we elevated climate change really as the top priority of the council's work. Uh, and that was very important. Uh, and I think it's the right place for us to be as now as we head into the, the Russian chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Um, and uh, going from the, the fundamental message here that, uh, that we recognize the security challenges in the Arctic region, we have our eyes wide open, we'll address those together with our allies, uh, but we're also emphasizing cooperation. We see, a, see the Arctic as a realm where scientific collaboration, where cooperation on safety and a whole number of areas uh, has to um, predominate. And so that's, that's our goal. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciated your points on residents being at the core of our approach to the Arctic and the long term, the long term take as well. I think that is too quickly forgotten when a new security challenge pops up. Um, and that is actually a theme I wanted to pick up on and come back to um, our two defense ministers on is, you know, I think it's very welcome um, in Europe and globally that President Biden uh, has, has come to Europe with this message of partnership with individual allies, NATO, the European Union, and has stressed that multilateralism is back. But given this delicate balance and these sensitivities in your respective regions of the Arctic, how do you see the division of tasks between national governments and multinational institutions like NATO and the EU? For example, are there certain issues that you would consider a national competency where you want to remain um, sort of in the lead in order to respond to the, that delicate balance between climate, environmental protection, the livelihood of citizens, and sustainable economic development? Um, Minister Bromson, could we begin with you, please? Mm. I, th I think oh, I, th I think it's I mean, it's important that uh, all countries uh, take uh, responsibility, uh, and that, that's what we're also doing from Danish side when we invest and make huge investments in security uh, in the in the Arctic. But when it comes to come to our values, we have to stand uh, together, and that's also why we from Danish side don't don't see uh, a dialogue with, for instance, uh, Russia. Uh, as, um, as something we do, because we have to stand together when it comes to the fight for our uh, democratic values and our system. I think um, uh, it was said that it's a co now it's a competition between uh, systems, and I totally agree. Uh, that's what we are standing in, in the middle of, a, a competition be between systems, and we are fighting for democracy. So therefore, uh, we should have the dialogue uh, with, um, with, the, with the institutions, uh, uh, and, and we should stand together in institutions like, uh, like uh, NATO. And when it comes uh, to, uh, to green solutions, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's another question. Uh, I think we, we have to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, move forward, each country 
and we have to uh, push uh, all we can and invest all we can, but we have to share uh, our uh, knowledge uh, with other countries. But we don't have uh, formal institutions uh, like we have when it comes to uh, to security policies uh, like uh, like like NATO. So we have to push and to um, to uh, to to share knowledge. I think that's uh, and 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 this is about time. So so we we can afford not to share knowledge. Thank you. I, I like how you've picked up there on some of the comparative advantages that the Kingdom of Denmark brings in terms of situational awareness and sort of having been ahead of the curve on climate and, and green technologies before they were all the rage. And I think, you know, in the United States, that's the type of leadership and focus that we're looking for from, from the other Arctic nations. Uh, Minister Sajjan, do you want to add on to that? And in particular, how, how Canada is seeing this balance between action at a national level and, and the renewed interest from NATO and the European Union in your region? Well, well first of all, um, it's, uh, multilateralism has always been uh, a, a, a pillar of Canada's foreign policy. Um, when we formed the government in 2015, this is something that our prime minister uh, has emphasized. And it's, uh, it's baked into our defense policy that multilateralism is extremely important. Why? Um, a nation needs to be able to step up and work closely uh, with NATO allies, cooperate on other aspects with the uh, EU, uh, be there uh, with the coalition uh, when other security challenges come up. Um, but you can't be a strong ally and, str um, and support good multilateralism if you don't have a very good strong foundation. And that's why you need to, a, a good national a strategy to making sure that you have the resilience, whether it's uh, not just from a defense perspective, you need to make sure that um, you have constant uh, research and development. Um, so you need to be able to make sure that you're able to contribute uh, uh, properly. And so uh, it's so as we kind of move forward, I think that there is there is a very important role. NATO plays a very important role. Our relationship with the EU uh, is extremely important, when, especially when it comes to uh, trade. And then when you put all this together, uh, in, and we're talking about the Arctic, we bring our own nation's values um, to, to the table, making sure that we maintain stability uh, in, in, uh, in the Arctic is extremely important. The impact of climate change and disruption of the ecosystem up north can have a significant impact. And as we talk about the global impact, uh, I'm glad we're, you know, people are talking about that there are people who live there. I've visited so many of the communities um, way up in the, in the, in the Arctic, uh, our Arctic Circle, uh, from, uh, from, from Inuvik or Rankin Inlet, um, where our troops are based in, uh, in Alert, where just the most northern uh, uh, habitable place on, on the planet. So. We have to build our own resiliency to be a good, credible uh, uh, multinational uh, partner. So, um, so we, we need to look at what are the tools that we can contribute, but there are certain things we need to uh, main, maintain strong at home. For example, one probably the most important that I can think of is uh, a cyber capability. Anything that we do has to be looked through a, a, a cyber lens, um, but you need to build those home national capabilities so that you can offer them up uh, if they're ever needed to allies. Thank you. That theme of resilience is something that we'll be picking up on in our US-EU-NATO panel later today. Um, it's certainly become a focus, not just in the Arctic, uh, but, but for those institutions as well. Both of you mentioned outside actors um, as well as other Arctic nations. Um, in terms of outside actors, I'm curious as to how you think Arctic nations should manage this increased interest in the Arctic, for example, um, from China, but, but also others. Uh, and then in terms of other Arctic nations, both of you mentioned Russia's military buildup in the region. But of course, um, like your countries, they have citizens living in the Arctic region. They have economic interests. How do you recommend we sort of manage um, these two actors? The one which is a fellow Arctic nation, but some, you know, questionable behavior in terms of, of military buildup and intentions. And another who's, who's sort of an outsider. Is there almost a right of first refusal for the Arctic nations in, in setting the rules of the road. Minister Bromson, let me start with you, please. Yeah, just some, some few comments uh, to what was said before, because I think 
what is really important here is that that democracies do not not fight each other. This is this is uh, so important. Uh, this is a, such an important situation uh, that we are standing in. Uh, so so it's really important that democracies don't spend time uh, fighting each other, but we spend time um, fighting uh, these uh, other systems uh, that will hurt our democracy. But when it comes to the dialogue uh, and to um, to the awareness uh, of uh, Russia and China, I think. It's uh, two different uh, threats uh, that we have to be aware of. Uh, and when it comes to Russia, uh, the one voice uh, speaking is really important and that we stand together and that we use the NATO power um, um, also, also in uh, our dialogue. When it comes to China, um, it's it's a little uh, different um, compared to the to um, to to compared to Russia. Uh, it's uh, the long perspective uh, we need to have on, and and it, it's it's a different uh, threat. Uh, they invest uh, and um, find new ways into uh, systems. Uh, so I think awareness uh, of what they are uh, doing and what their plan is uh, is, is the more, most important uh, here now. Thank you so much. Mr. Minister Sajjan, please. No, obviously, as, as Russia being an, an Arctic nation themselves, they also uh, play a very important role and we need to have conversations with them. Um, and at the same time, we have to be extremely mindful of the security threats that um, uh, when it comes to um, some of the um, uh, interdictions that they've done you know, com coming into our airspace and the U.S. as well, uh, this is concerning. But we need to also be extremely mindful that the Arctic Council has been a very productive organization that allowed for a, 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 a thoughtful conversation to making sure that we maintain the Arctic as a peaceful region have difficult conversations regarding the economic uh, development. But we have to be so mindful that, that the Arctic can't be seen as uh, doing um, economic uh, or resource uh, uh, kind of extraction it, it, like in other places. It'll be an absolute disaster if, uh, uh, if resource development in the Arctic is done, is done poorly. So we, we have to be extremely mindful of, of that. Plus, we also know this can lead to, to, to greater tension. And so this has to be extremely um, thoughtful, thoughtful in its approach. Uh, currently, with the Arctic Council uh, conversations, we're hoping that it'll continue in, in that direction. But I think we also need to send a very strong message, as my, uh, my colleague, Mr. Brownson, has said, uh, that uh, democratic nations, a lot of them uh, who are also NATO allies will 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 work in in cooper cooperation, and especially when it comes to Canada U.S. relationships, um, we have um, our binational command uh, NORAD, uh, which we work quite collaboratively, and we have done for for a very very long time to send a strong message. And nations that are not Arctic nations who have an interest, this is something that we have to be extremely mindful. We um, the economic interests is understandable. However, it can't come at the expense of, of, the, of, of the nations who are in, in the north. Um, not just the climate change impact, but just imagine operating in that region if something goes wrong with a ship um, when it comes to search and rescue. And, and it can't happen. It is a quite the operation to launch any type of search and rescue um, in the north. And, uh, and we've recently, um, I think it was about a year and a half ago, where, where a Russian sh a ship ran into problems, and we had to provide uh, uh, provide support. But but imagine if this is not done in, in coordination. Uh, it, it could be absolute disasters, and also it can lead to miscalculation as well. But we should not leave any, um, uh, any wiggle room. When it comes to our own sovereignty and national securities, this is something we'll take very seriously, but Canada will also send a very strong message when it comes to the Arctic. We want to make sure that it remains uh, remains peaceful. And when it comes to any type, type of uh, a resource extraction or economic interest, this is something we have to be very mindful in how we, and move very slowly because it can be absolutely disastrous in the Arctic and lead to even greater climate change if we get this wrong. Thank you.
that focus on national responsibility and existing frameworks is, is very much welcome. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time here, but I did want to go to Jim DeHart uh, just one more time. Um, Jim, you know, we've talked a lot about climate today, but we've also talked a lot about security. And as the ministers highlighted, the frameworks we have in the Arctic Council have served us very well in terms of search and rescue, environmental cooperation and whatnot. But what about these security threats? Um, what is your position on, let's say, a military code of conduct in the region or the possibility of a security dialogue with Russia? Uh, and would you have a preferred, preferred format for this dialogue? Yeah, thanks. Well, I think I think we have to ask ourselves the question: uh, Is the um, is the problem the lack of a format, uh, or is it um, something deeper um, and and more challenging to uh, to overcome? Uh, I, you know, we remain committed to um, uh, to Ukraine's sovereignty, uh, to the decisions we took in 2014. Uh, we have to be careful. Uh, not to uh, revert to sort of a business as usual uh, with Russia. Um, but we also have to maximize uh, our use of existing mechanisms. We have uh, transparency uh, mechanisms through the Vienna document, through uh, we have a bilateral mechanism, INCSI, incidents um, at sea and in the air. Uh, you know, so, so we have to make every effort uh, to avoid the possibility of, of miscalculation. But I think you know, proceed on, on the basis of the right analysis. You know, I, I want to just align myself very strongly with with what both ministers have said, and 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 underscore the the importance of our solidarity uh, in in NATO um, uh, when we talk about uh, Russia and and China as a uh, you know as a longer term challenge uh, where we have to make sure we're looking at those activities through a national security lens. And then finally, that the Arctic is not ungoverned space. We have uh, strong institutions, strong international rules, strong international law, national sovereignty. And I think, um, you know, on that basis, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very confident that we can keep the Arctic peaceful. Excellent. Um, so, Minister Romson and, and Minister Sajin, I'd like to just give you the final word um, in our last three minutes here. If you wanted to add on to Jim's comments about this architecture, I, I think he said it well, um, but I wanted to give you the floor in case you had anything to add. It's, it's particularly striking to me that both your countries are, are members of NATO, and when I look at the language in the NATO communique, um, it does seem quite careful to me. They actually don't say Arctic, they say High North, which I know our Norwegian colleagues will be happy to see uh, in the dialogue. So do you have any views on this um, structure for discussing security, um, harder security with Russia? Um, and in particular, um, maybe a final comment on NATO's role in the Arctic. Um, what, how much of a NATO role do we need to have at this point? Thank you. Uh, Minister Bromson, you go first again, please. <laughs> I, th I think it's really important that we uh, that we won't uh, escalate the situation uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 the high north, uh, the Arctic. Um, but I also think it's really important that we are not naive because uh, there's not a uh, space to, to, to be naive uh, in these times. So I think uh, everything what we can do uh, with eyes and ears uh, and communication in the Arctic is uh, really important. Uh, but it's uh, it's also important that we that we share informations and uh, I think if 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 there was a, a, a time for uh, cooperation before it's really there now uh, I I I I don't think in uh, in a historic perspective it has been uh, more important uh, than 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 now because as it it was uh, as it has been said uh, many times in 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 this debate. This is a fight about values. Uh, this is a, a fight about democracies. Thank you. Thank you. And the final final word to you, Mr. S Minister Sajin. No, thank you. And uh, I mean, as uh, uh, we are both uh, NATO uh, allies, and Mr. Brownson and I actually have worked quite closely on other operations, uh, especially in uh, uh, in Iraq, where they took command of the the NATO. Uh, training mission there uh, from, from Canada, uh, and that's all we Canada will work. We'll always work in a multi 
on multilateral uh, forum, uh, we will uh, uh, work in cooperation. But when it comes to uh, to the Arctic, we all a nation needs to also make the uh, the thorough investments, and that's why in our defense policy we committed to uh, upgrading um, uh, NORAD uh, and modernizing it, which we have. And in fact, um, uh, President Biden and Prime Minister uh, Trudeau both agreed on the roadmap, which included the roadmap uh, towards. Uh, NORAD modernization, which leads to greater continental uh, defense. And so this includes research and development, um, greater cooperations on exercises, and looking at the, at the next steps. And when you have greater investments on security, which also takes into account the people who live there, it sends a very strong message of deterrence. It's something that uh, NATO does very, very well. And we'll, so Canada will work very closely with the U.S. and its, its other close allies to making sure that the Arctic remains uh, peaceful. Well, thank you. I, <clears throat> I think that's the perfect note to end on, this balance between drawing on these comparative advantages and the expertise of all of our countries as sort of keepers of, of the preciousness of the Arctic region, um, but also drawing on that multilateralism and those frameworks that, that have served us so well. So I believe I uh, will conclude us for today and, and thank you for your time. Um, and Jim, we can't see you on the screen, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and good luck at, at the Nordic Defense uh, Minister's meeting. Thanks, Rachel, and thank you to our panelists. Rachel will be back with us a little later to discuss EU-US-NATO relationship. And our first conversation really showed us how global our discussion is. Rachel was in Washington, minister was in Canada, the Danish defense minister was in Finland, just about 82 kilometers where our studio is here in Tallinn, Estonia. And our next discussion makes our world picture even more global. We are going to Africa, but before that, we are taking a short break, just about two, three minutes, to have a chance for you to stretch or to make a cup of coffee, and then we hope you'll be back here shortly. So please stay tuned.
This is day two of the EU Defense Washington Forum organized by the European Union delegation to the United States and the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. And before we continue, a short reminder, you as viewers can also participate. If you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, you can do so by using the Ask Live questions here button that is on your screen, or you can also participate in the discussion online by using the hashtag EU Defense on social media. That's EU Defense, and remember the defense was S. As we continue, we now move south from the Arctic, that was the topic of our first discussion, to Africa, to Sahel region. The security challenges in Mali and elsewhere in Africa have direct impacts on Europe and the United States. And joining us now uh, is João Gomes Cravinho, Minister of National Defense of Portugal. He is in a conversation with Chad Devermont, Director of the Africa Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. So, Chad, the screen, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, welcome. My name is Judd Devermont. I'm the director of the Africa program here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. And it's really an honor to be here uh, at the EU Defense Washington Forum to participate in this high level conversation. We're gonna to discuss today the security challenges in Sub-Saharan Africa. Really, these have become much more complex over the last couple of years and increasingly elusive to resolve. Let me just give you a couple of points. The extremist threat in the Sahel is expanding, and we are seeing signs of unrest now in coastal West Africa. The Islamic insurgency in northern Mozambique uh, has grown in sophistication, contributing to a humanitarian crisis and jeopardizing a significant LNG development. There has been a surge in piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, making it the world's number one hotspot uh, for kidnapping. And then there is civil war and conflict uh, in the Horn of Africa, and that is undercutting very fragile transitions in Sudan, Somalia, and Ethiopia. Now that is a very grim picture to be sure, but there are some positive developments. There's been a gathering of African, European, and other countries who are raising their hands to respond to these challenges. That doesn't mean that there's a consensus on how to address the underlying drivers, or even a straightforward division of labor and assessment of each tool that these countries are bringing to the table. But it's an important start, something that we haven't had in the last four years, especially as the United States rejoins the international community and is undertaking a review of its own global security posture and its key priorities. So it's this specific moment, which I hope the minister will share his thoughts on. After some brief opening remarks, we're gonna discuss his assessment of these various challenges, whether we have the right strategy in place to address these hotspots, and then how do we foster more US, EU, and African cooperation? So I'm delighted to be joined uh, by the minister for a, a little opening remarks before we get into a moderated Q&A. Sir? Chad, uh, we are back in the studio. We have to inform you that minister has not yet uh, logged in online to our conference. We're hoping to see him very shortly. So I'll give back the floor to you if you want to have your remarks a little bit uh, more elaborated for, for this conversation. And we hope Minister Carina will be with us very shortly. Sure, thank you for that. Let me expand a little bit on the, the international landscape because I think that's exactly where the minister is going to have to, to weigh in. Uh, in the Sahel, we have really uh, a mix of very different actors trying to respond to these challenges in Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, and Niger. So you have a UN mission known as MINUSMA, you have the EU training mission, you have the French operation known as Barkhane, you have a EU European task force known as Takuba, and then on the African side, you have the G5 Sahel, 
force, which is comprised of all five countries of the Sahel, and a couple of nascent initiatives, including uh, the Accra Initiative out of Ghana. So one of the things that the minister is going to have to help us think through, as and the U.S. is doing this concurrently, is how do all of these different pieces work together? What is the right posture uh, for, for example, the United States? How does MINUSMA, as a UN peacekeeping mission, one of the biggest in the world that often takes the most casualties, including recently an attack on, on German and Belgian peacekeepers, you know, what is the mandate, the mission? How does it support Barkhan? How does it support the G5 Sahel? What is in which uh, we need to think about U.S. support? There's significant, excuse me, U.N. support. There's significant debate about assessed costs uh, for uh, some of these missions. And as many of you are already aware, Prime Min President Macron has announced that Barkhan is going to be wrapping up. And so what is the onus on the Europeans through Task Force to Cuba? What is the onus on MINUSMA and the G5 Sahel and, and the U.S. presence and its support uh, to these various missions as we go forward? As we move south to, to Mozambique, um, I spoke briefly about this Islamic insurgency uh, that uh, emerged in October 2017, and then just very recently took the major town of Palma, which required Total to do a force majeure. Now they've receded from Palma, but they still control some smaller towns further up north. They were able to do a very sophisticated maritime and land attack. The U.S. has responded uh, with a pledge to uh, put some uh, forces in training for the Mozambicans. The Portuguese have done the same, and now the UN has approved this mission. And just very recently, the South African Defense, uh, the South African Development Community, SADC, has approved uh, a mission. So again, how do all of these forces work together? How do we make sure that it's not just a military approach, but we're addressing the underlying grievances? And then to the east, uh, for those of you who are not tracking, yesterday was a very significant development in the eight month long civil war in Ethiopia, uh, where the um, Tigrayan Defense Force took uh, the ca regional capital of Mekele and the, the government in response declared a unilateral ceasefire. This has been a day one priority for the US administration. The EU has been very active as well. And what does this sort of moment mean? Is this an opportunity to build on peace and, and the tremendous amounts of insecurity, human rights abuses, mass atrocities? Is this just a wrinkle, a pause in the fighting? How do we work together to make sure that we haven't lost this opportunity? So I think those are some of the, the real challenges that are, are, are ahead of us. And in all of these cases, I tried to pull out the African response, whether it's in the Sahel or in Mozambique, and, and certainly the African Union uh, and others in in Ethiopia, and that is really critical here. This is not going to be the US and the Europe responding singly by themselves, but it's going to be a partnership in cooperation. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know if the minister has joined us. I can continue to elaborate. Yeah, uh, minister has not joined us yet, but uh, Judd, you are following closely the developments in Africa. We have not discussed in this conference, in this forum, at this forum, uh, COVID issues, but this is one of the big fields that the Europe and the United States are working now together to provide vaccines to the African countries that are really lacking them, lacking the, the means to produce them. Could you briefly address that issue? That, that is really like the immediate uh, cooperation of, of the European Union and United States in Africa. Hey, I can hear you. Sorry. I...
We are continuing our live broadcast of the EU-Washington Defence Summit Forum. Uh, the security challenges in Africa is our topic, challenges in Mali and elsewhere in Africa that have direct impacts on Europe and the United States. And now we are glad to welcome uh, Minister of National Defence of Portugal, João Gomes Cravinho, who have joined us and the conversation he will have now is Jod Devermont, who is back with us. Jod is director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Jod, about five, six minutes. Now you can have the conversation that we've been waiting for. The floor is yours. Very much. Are you? Yes, you can hear me. Great. Um, firstly, my apologies for uh, this, uh, these technical difficulties on, on our side. Um, I'd like to, in through five very short uh, minutes, present essentially three ideas. The first one, a generic one, about the moment that we're living in the transatlantic relationship. I think that um, President Biden uh, has made very clear over the past uh, uh, six months his uh, very strong commitment to this transatlantic relationship. And this has been received with enthusiasm and uh, uh, um, I think a, a degree of uh, relief in uh, Europe. Um, Secretary Blinken has been making the same points. Both President Biden and Secretary Blinken have been engaging very much with the European Union. And I think the, point, the first point that I would like to make is that this engagement should also extend to the field of defense. The nature of, uh, nature of the transatlantic relationship has been strained over the past few years. And um, the fact that it is necessary to reinforce NATO's credentials as a platform of political dialogue um, should not mean that we don't uh, also engage between the European Union and, um, and the United States. And that this is very relevant when one comes to Africa, which is the point that I would like to uh, follow up with. The African continent is undergoing severe security crisis. We're finding uh, an enormous arc of instability and state disaggregation uh, that goes from uh, all across the Sahel, uh, from uh, Mauritania in the west right to Sudan in, in the east, and further south, Central African Republic, and Congo, and um, even northern Mozambique, as we've seen lately. This important point about this is that there are internal dynamics, and there are dynamics that come from outside of the continent. Terrorism, jihadism, of course, very much so. There is also geopolitical competition happening on the continent. Russia and China are extremely active uh, on the African continent. Russia has developed a model of working with uh, mercenaries that are paid for with um, mining concessions, which means that it is a very cheap way of uh, gaining influence in, in various parts of the African continent. And um, 
The reality, therefore, is that as the U.S. shifts its focus to the Indo-Pacific, it is very important that the, in, through the engagement with the European Union, the U.S. should remain a relevant partner for, uh, for the African continent. So the point that I would like to make there is that if we're looking at geopolitical competition worldwide, as the U.S. has to, uh, it is not just about relating to Europe uh, in the European continent, and in the uh, uh, Asian Pacific arena, but also looking at partnering with the European Union in, uh, in Africa. On the Sahel itself, here we have a very major challenge and that results from the fact that many parts of the population of the Sahel countries do not see government as being a provider of public goods that they need. And it is fundamental for uh, us to be able to support the countries of the region to shift the analysis so that the populations see uh, the armed groups, the jihadi groups, as their main, um, as the main obstacle for their uh, livelihoods. And the only way of doing this is by investing in their security and the Europe uh, European Union is, is present in, in that field and needs to become increasingly present and by investing as well with our civilian uh, toolkit to support those countries. But the fundamental point is that there has to be improvements in terms of governance. Otherwise, uh, with all the goodwill in the world, we will not achieve uh, that objective. So there, uh, the, the most relevant issue, I think, is that uh, when one works with uh, with the European Union, I'm saying when the United States works with the European Union, it doesn't necessarily have to be boots on the ground. It should be, though, uh, supporting the European Union, enabling the European Union to be a very proactive defense partner for the United States. And this requires uh, engagement, requires dialogue. We haven't had that yet between the EU and the US. And I would like to use this opportunity to make a pitch uh, for that uh, engagement because I see it as key to us uh, helping to bring stability to the African continent. Thank you. Well, Mr. Minister, I'm really glad that you were able to join us and those were incredibly important points to share with the audience. Let me just foot stomp a couple of things that you said that it is imperative that even though the US is focused on the Indo-Pacific to not forget about Africa, to engage in Africa. The problems in Africa affect all of us, the opportunities in Africa we all benefit from. And you know, I think that the US is not alone here. We do have European partners. We also have African partners. The big challenge is not only addressing the governance issues that you recommended, but also thinking more broadly about the architecture. We can't just keep appointing envoys and throwing military you know, re resources at this or funding. We have to think about how we are going to cooperate together effectively with a division of labor, with a clear plan. And I think that's where the next steps are. And I just want to echo your call for a conversation about about this between the US, the Europeans, as well as the Africans. So thank you so much for your time, sir. Um, I'm not sure if we have any more uh, availability uh, to chat. On but my side, do, yes. I'm not sure about the bandwidth, but on my side, absolutely. Great. Um, well, let me, let me ask you one. I think we're out of time. Is that correct, moderator? Yes, we are, we are out of time for this conversation, unfortunately, but uh, let, let me thank you again, uh, Jot Devermont, Director of the Africa Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and uh, João Gomes Cravinho, Minister of National Defense of Portugal, for this short conversation. And we are remaining in Africa, focused on Africa. Now we will have a panel of high-ranking military officers who will provide a ground-level breakdown of U.S. and EU military engagement on the African continent, as we heard that the continent is really turbulent at, at this time. But to help set the stage for our next discussion, let us watch first two videos. First, a video showcasing EU's mission to monitor Libya's UN arms embargo, and then a second short video that takes us to EUTM's training mission in Mali.
a captain from the Finnish Army and I'm here in Kulikoro as a chief instructor assistant for EUTM. EUTM is here on a training mission and our main effort is to train the Malian soldiers and mainly the trained trainers in pedagogy, human security, military basic skills and leadership. The security we can help establish here in Mali it will increase security for the African people and uh, through that it will also have a security effect for the Europeans. I actually enjoy it a lot. Uh, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Every achievement is uh, always a proud moment for us when we see the faces of the people that graduate from our courses. You're watching the live broadcast of EU Defense Washington Forum. Our topic is Africa. But before we continue our discussions, the reminder to our viewers, we encourage you to participate in the forum's discussions. You can do so by asking a question to uh, using the Ask Live Questions Here button at the center of the page. You can ask questions from our panelists, and also by using the hashtag EU Defense on social media. That's EU Defense with an S. And now I'm pleased to introduce the speakers for the next panel that will bring together two high ranking military officers from European Union and the United States. Vice Admiral Herve Plujan, Director General of EU Military Staff, and General Stephen J. Townsend, Commander of US Africa Command. Moderating this conversation is Pentagon's reporter for Politico, Lara Seligman. And Lara, the screen now is yours. Hello, good morning. Thank you all for being here to talk about European and US military engagement in Africa. Before the start of this panel, we watched a brief video detailing the EU training mission in Mali. So here now, I think, to give us a more detailed look at the operation is EU training mission Mali Mission Force Commander Brigadier General Fernando Grazia. Do we have the video? I am Brigadier General Fernando Luis Gracia Herreiz, Spanish Army, currently the UTM Mali Mission Force Commander. I'm commanding almost 1,000 soldiers from 25 European countries, 22 of them European Union member states, and three non-European Union member states. UTM Mali provides the military effort as part of the European integrated approach to support Mali. Our mission is to assist this country to build up credible and autonomous armed forces to face the terrorist threat and enforce the internal Malian security and stability. The Council of the European Union, by the UTM Mali Fifth Mandate, decided to extend the mission for four years until 2024. As key issue, the new mandate increased its level of ambition. Consequently, and beyond to stand the area of the operations all along the J5 Sahel nations, the centralized activities and non-executive accompaniment consist now the priority. The situation in Mali is very complex. Not only terrorist activities, but also traditional inter-ethnic clashes, political tensions, and historic illegal trade flows coexist and interact in this unstable region. Therefore, we must understand and assume that UTM Mali is a long-term mission. However, we can see day by day the fruits of the hard job. The Malians really deserve a better future life.
All right, great. Well, there's a lot to talk about here, so I would like to just jump right in. Um, General Townsend, you made some headlines re recently when you spoke about a wildfire of terrorism that's spreading across the continent from the Sahel to the Horn of Africa. So can you talk broadly about what you meant by this and what the U.S. military is doing to stop it? Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Laura. Um, so first, what did I mean when I spoke about uh, wildfire? Um, so our assessment is, AFRICOM's assessment is that the um, spread of terrorism uh, has continued relatively unabated in the Sahel. So despite uh, the best efforts of our all, all of our best efforts, uh, this terrorism continues to spread. Uh, so I'm concerned about it spreading from the Sahel into the littoral states. Uh, and so that's kind of what I meant when I said wildfire of terrorism. Uh, so what is the U.S. doing about it? The U.S. supports our partners. Our African partners first. We do that mostly on a bilateral basis. Uh, we also support our European partners um, and uh, the EU, for example, uh, the French in particular. Uh, we're supporting those partners uh, to, because I think the U.S. views this uh, as an African problem first, a European problem second. U.S. is there to help. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And Admiral Blajon, just following off of that, the EU and particularly the French have been involved militarily in this region for years. So can you talk about how this threat has evolved recently, uh, the rise of the Islamic State, Al-Shabaab and other terrorist groups, environmental changes that have impacted the region, and, and of course the coronavirus pandemic? Yes, certainly. Thank you for your question, Rara, and good morning, Or So um, I've, I've been monitoring, because I'm the mission commander for all the EU terms, I've been monitoring these areas for, for one year now, and uh, I've been involved in some experience there. What I can say is that there are some trends, and uh, even being an optimistic guy by nature, uh, which are not going in the right direction. You mentioned environment. Uh, the climate change has a deep impact in Africa. Uh, to give you some figures, uh, in Sahel, the desert is progressing seven kilometers a year, uh, and, and it's not uh, slowing down. Uh, in Somalia, we had several flooding, locust invasion, and that provoked 600,000 uh, uh, IDPs in, in, in the country. So that's part of the situation uh, and it's not, it's not helping. The other characteristic that I, I see in command is, of course, the insecurity and instability, uh, either coming from terrorist armed groups who can easily recruit, not based on ideology, but based on their ability to pay the, the new recruits and to face, uh, uh, especially youth, an employment. Uh, so they can recruit, they can uh, also uh, continue uh, to to feed their their uh, their um, uh, I would say basket of of, of new recruits uh, all the time they are suffering some some losses uh, and another characteristic is that all the countries we are acting in are all characterized by volatile political situation in Mali we had a coup last year we had a kind of coup in the coup uh, in May uh, in Central African Republic. Uh, we had a uh, difficult uh, presidential election in December, tri triggering uh, armed groups uh, activities. In Somalia, uh, we had a certainty on the uh, uh, presidential election, even if it's getting better. So that's the environment uh, we are working in and, and EU is, is key among uh, and along with the allies, especially the, the US and also other member states, but also Africa, uh, African Union, uh, to help the armed forces of this country to remain what they have to do, politically neutral and engaged uh, for the security of their people. 
Right. Of course, in the context that we just talked about is really crucial, I think, to understanding the dynamics here and particularly in the rise of these terrorist groups. So right before the pandemic started, actually, I, I went to West Africa to cover Flintlock, which, as you know, is one of the largest special operations military exercises in the world. So I saw firsthand how Western militaries can make a difference in helping local forces fight terrorism. Um, for both of you, can you talk about the importance of joint exercises like these? And uh, maybe General Townsend, we'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, so Flintlock, I'm glad you went there. Flintlock uh, 2020 was a fantastic exercise. Uh, we had more than 1,600 uh, service members participating in Flintlock from more than 30 African and Western nations. Uh, so our view of these exercises is it's a one of the best ways uh, to bring allies and partners together uh, to work on common uh, security objectives and to share knowledge and best practices. So uh, sort of a, a coalition of the uh, willing and the like-minded. Uh, and uh, th these exercises serve as an excellent vehicle for that. Flintlock's been going on for uh, quite some time uh, and it attracts a larger uh, population of participants and observers uh, every year. Uh, we're very fond of Flintlock, which has a special operations uh, focus for US AFRICOM. Um, I think these things are important because they uh, allow us to sh share uh, best practices and improve our interoperability. So if we're going to operate uh, together on the battlefield, we have to exercise so we know how each other, uh, each of our armies work. It all do our equipment, will our equipment uh, uh, interact well with one another, our procedures, communications, those kind of things. So I think the exercises are very important uh, and uh, we seek in US AFRICOM to continue our exercises, uh, not only in West Africa, but across the continent and both air, land and sea. Thanks. Great, now Admiral Bajan, uh, do you wanna to add to that? Yes, certainly. So uh, I think the, the, the added value of this exercise, as, um, as Stefan said, was what are about the cohesion also of the African countries and to understand that they, it's before everything else, the African security is a matter for the African people. And so building that cohesion is, is very important. Uh, and I would say on the other hand, this exercise can be conducted only in kind of safe and secure environment. So you need to have conditions, you need to find the, the right place uh, to make sure that the exercise uh, will provide all the outcomes that are expecting. But in the contrary, when I'm seeing in, in Mali, Central African or, or Somalia, uh, it's very difficult for these countries to take part of this exercise or to hold exercises in, in, their, in their country because what they need at the present time is to fight against terrorism. So it's to uh, implement training, try to be autonomous and then go in operation and fight and try to, to win the war. So, and, and I think we have to understand and respect that and, and uh, not to try to divert them too much from, uh, from their core uh, mission. Yeah, that's certainly an important consideration. Um, Admiral Bajan, you mentioned Somalia in your opening call, or your answer to a previous question. There was a report recently that the, the Biden administration is weighing sending special operations trainers back to Somalia to help local forces combat al-Shabaab after former President Trump withdrew them last year. So General, General Townsend, can you confirm that this proposal is something that is under discussion? And for both of you, what is more broadly the importance of having Western forces in Somalia given the growing terrorist threat there. Thanks, Laura. Uh, so you're right, uh, at President Biden's uh, direction, the, uh, the US Department of Defense is undertaking mm -hmm. what's called a global posture review, the purpose of which is to ensure that our force posture uh, around the world uh, is aligned appropriately with our national defense strategy. That's the purpose of it. Uh, and so I've been communicating back and forth uh, with uh, my civilian leaders in the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, and giving uh, him options. 
Um, and I think uh, we'll keep those options right where they should be in private communications with the Secretary of Defense so our civilian leaders have the opportunity to make uh, their decisions. Uh, this, these decisions, we're still awaiting these decisions. Um, I would say, though, that um, there's really no denying that our repositioning, uh, fairly sudden repositioning out of Somalia uh, earlier this year, uh, has introduced new layers of risk and complexity uh, to our mission there. Uh, so uh, what we're trying to do is manage that risk and complexity as we still try to help our African partners uh, with their security challenges with Al-Shabaab, an arm of Al-Qaeda, the, the, the world's largest, best financed, most active, kinetically active arm of Al-Qaeda. So we see threats there to uh, African stability. We see threats in Somalia to uh, regional stability, and we even see threats, uh, potential threats there to the U.S. homeland. So it's very important that we uh, continue to work through this challenge with our partners. Right now, we're commuting back and forth to work. Um, I think that, as I mentioned before, uh, layers of complexity and risk with that, or we're engaging with our partners virtually. And uh, probably as Hervé will share with you, uh, my belief is that the best uh, way to engage with partners uh, is uh, side by side and face to face, shoulder to shoulder. So uh, it's much more difficult to do that. And we have limited opportunities to do that when we uh, fly in and fly out to do training uh, and advising. So um, anyway, we've given our uh, recommendations to uh, our civilian leaders and we're waiting for them to make their uh, judgments on those recommendations. Uh, meanwhile, we continue to work as much as we can with our partners uh, to solve this problem, this challenge of uh, Al-Shabaab in East Africa. Admiral Blaisjean, do you want to expand upon that? Yes, certainly, and uh, I, I cannot agree uh, more with with uh, what Stefan said about uh, uh, the face-to-face -face contact and the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder, uh, action. Um, wh why are we needed in Somalia? Uh, first, because we are welcome there and, and uh, invited by the Somalian uh, government. Secondly, the war is far to be over, and, and they need some help to uh, make that journey to the autonomy of the security and uh, armed uh, forces. And that's what, that's where we can really help them uh, to, 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 to grow. Uh, of course, there is also the AMISOM, the African uh, operation with still 18,000 people there. But I would say at this stage, uh, Al-Shabaab still enjoys a lot of freedom of action uh, on the territory. When I was there one month ago, there has been two suicide uh, bombing uh, not very far away from where uh, I was staying. So, so you can really feel the atmospheric of the insecurity there. And, and the problem with the, the, the design of uh, at the present time of the Amisom mandate and the help to uh, Somalia is that each time they have a, a, a tactic uh, success, tactical success, um, they will position and hold the fort there. And so more they are progressing, less mobility they are having. And so we have to help uh, the, 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 uh, the Somalian armed forces to get that, that mobility uh, to, to, to fight against Al-Shabaab, which is uh, very mobile. So that's what we are doing, uh, I've been when I've been there, I've discussed a lot with the U.S. embassy. Uh, the U.S. here have, have done a fantastic job, especially with the DANAB, the special forces, which is very complementary to what we are doing to the regular uh, armed forces. And the you know the Somalian people, they are uh, emotional uh, people, and and I think they are much more comfortable with presence and physical contact. And, 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 and help and support than with the virtual one. So, uh, of course, it's above my pay grade uh, to give uh, any advice, but I, I would just would like to comment looking in the, in the previous years, how, uh, how good 
was the cooperation between EU and US on that field and very complementary. So if we can continue, that will be uh, uh, excellent for an excellent news for me. So I want to just squeeze in one last of my own questions before we get to audience Q&A. Um, when I was in Mauritania and Senegal last year, one of the top concerns I heard was China and Russia increasingly exerting influence in Africa. China on the economic front, investing in infrastructure, and Russia on the military front, sending arms and trainers. Can you both talk about how you see the rising threat from China and Russia across the continent and how to counter it? I'm particularly interested in the involvement of Russian mercenaries in places like the Central African Republic and Libya. Uh, General Townsend, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Laura. So um, both China and Russia uh, are competing. Uh, they're competing fiercely uh, in Africa. Um, I think the Russians' uh, competition there is uh, very uh, self-interested and exploitative. I don't, I don't believe either one of these actors are really there to uh, help uh, Africa in the long run. But in, in Russia's case, uh, I think they're there uh, to exploit uh, the continent uh, for their own gain. And you mentioned the presence of Russian mercenaries there. Groups like Wagner uh, and other groups like that are, um, well, there's, there's a reporting in the media today about a UN report that's going to accuse uh, Wagner of atrocities uh, in the Central African Republic, as an example. Uh, we have pointed out uh, at the actions of Wagner in Libya uh, just a few months ago. So I don't think uh, these actors are helping uh, Africans. That's what I believe. Um, turning to China, China has done a lot of investment. Um, I don't think the United States, I know that U.S. AFRICOM, we don't ask our African partners to choose between uh, China uh, and the United States. Uh, we offer uh, what we uh, offer, uh, U.S. values, uh, democratic values, uh, just like the European Union. Uh, that's what we bring. Uh, all of our cards are on the table. We play with our cards facing out, as the saying goes. Uh, and we offer uh, our skills. And um, I think that's an attractive proposition uh, for most uh, of our African partners. Um, we're not going to compete with uh, Chinese investment in uh, infrastructure. Um, and um, I think that uh, these countries ought to just go into these relationships with their eyes wide open, right? So I think that it's possible uh, to do business with China, but you better be on your game and have your eyes and ears open. Uh, and I don't think that uh, runs against U.S. interests, in particularly uh, or generally. Um, I think, though, that uh, a lot of our partners, uh, they're interested in what uh, European allies, what the U.S. has to offer uh, because of our democratic values. And um, I think they can see that uh, with their, their own eyes. So that kind of to sum up... Um, I don't think uh, Russia is out for the best interests of Africa and probably in the long term, neither is China, but China is bringing a lot of investment to the continent. And I would just urge our African partners, try to take advantage of that without getting taken advantage of. Admiral Blejean. Yeah, thank you. So I will, I will start to uh, with, with China. Um, uh, so uh, as uh, General Johnson said, the, the they are, China and Russia are, are posing very different challenges. China is tailoring uh, its its support uh, to each country, uh, adapting uh, the answer uh, to each country, answering immediately their expressed needs. But in 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 the by doing that, also trapping them uh, in in their net and and uh, uh, establishing bonds uh, for for life that they will be unable to to pay back and so at the end i think we will wake up one day and then most of the resources of of, of africa will legally 
uh, belong uh, to China, and that, and that should be that should be a, a, a real concern. On, on Russia, so I was in Central African Republic last week, uh, and I, I saw Wagner. I saw them on the on, on the field. They are everywhere, and it's a very different model than than China. They bring nothing to the country except uh, except immediate security uh, answer, uh, maybe with the price of. Uh, uh, committing a lot of exactions and violations of human rights and 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 atrocities, as as uh, Stefan said, they are real, and that's what they are doing. And and in, in that way, also uh, dragging uh, the the Central African uh, forces with them in this uh, in the in, in those uh, wrong be behavior. They are not there to uh, to uh, give any money to to bring anything to the economy and and their two motivation is to try to get uh, as a reward or by controlling some areas uh, the, their hand on some uh, resources like mining and uh, on the other uh, uh, their other motivation is really uh, they are a pain in the neck for for us uh, and, and when when I uh, and they are very happy that they are destabilizing uh, the the West Front, the uh, US and, and EU on on that. I, I've discussed that a lot with President Tuadera uh, last week, and I told him, you have to acknowledge it's not a viable solution. Uh, it's reputational risk for you because of the violation of human rights. Uh, when things will be done, uh, you'll have no control. On, on Wagner, uh, and, and you'll have lost some some uh, sovereignty uh, to them, and it's not acceptable. So, so I told him, okay, you have to stop that. You have to change uh, your 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 model, and and we can help you uh, to do that with uh, uh, UN, uh, EU, uh, US partners, African partners you are comfortable with, to help you to support uh, your the, the armed forces with viable and value uh, solutions that will be acceptable in your country and also on the international uh, community. Uh, I think Central African Republic is the most uh, visible uh, area with, with Libya for, for where, where Wagner is deployed. I see that a bit less in, 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 in Mali and, and especially in Somalia. Mm. Well, I've been told that we can go a little bit over our panel time since we started late, so I'll just take one question from the audience. Uh, that question is, should we place AFRICOM headquarters on the continent to ensure commitment, security, and partnership? Uh, General Townsend, do you want to take that one? <laughs> thank you, Laura. And whoever was the uh, question asker, thank you very much for that final question. Uh, Actually, AFRICOM is very happy to be right where we are in Europe, in Germany, with our host nation partners here. And it'd be tough to find a place in Africa. How would we choose, right? 54 countries on the continent. I don't know how we'd choose one. I think we're in a great place. Thanks. And Robejan, do you have any thoughts on that? Where, where uh, of course, it's not my, my concern, but I, I would say only that, that having our two commands located in Europe is really the, the relationship. I have a, a liaison officer from Africa in, in, in my staff. We can visit each other uh, easily. That would be more difficult uh, with another location. Great. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So thank you so much to our panelists for taking the time and having a great discussion. And thank you also to CSIS and the EU delegation for hosting this event. Thanks so much. Thank you for this discussion. And now we'll take a short coffee break. Please come back for our next panel that will be on emerging and disruptive technologies. And we'll see you back here at 25 minutes past the hour.
And welcome back to day two of the EU Defense Washington Forum. Bringing our conversation north again, we now want to look at the state of NATO. So central to EU-US defense cooperation, the alliance felt some strange in the last four years, but has felt a strong US recommitment, also expressed in the context of the NATO summit two weeks ago. There is a lot of work going on between the EU and NATO, including on enhancing military mobility across the continent. Recently, the US was welcomed to join the PESCO project on military mobility. But how prepared is NATO to face future challenges, such as threats from emerging and disruptive technologies? For that conversation, we are joined again by Deputy Director and Senior Fellow with the CSIS's Europe, Russia and Eurasia program, Rachel Elahus, along with Charles Fries, Deputy Secretary General for CSTP and Crisis Response for the European External Action Service, and Uros Lambret, State Secretary at the Slovenian Ministry of Defence. Also in this conversation is James Mackey, Director of Security Policy and Partnerships for NATO. But before we start, uh, once again, if you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, you can do so by using the Ask Live Questions Here button at the center of the page. You can also participate in the discussion online by using the hashtag EU Defense on social media. That's EU Defense with an S. And now we're again to Rachel, to Washington, D.C. Thank you, Nima, and welcome to our panelists. I'm really delighted to be hosting this panel. I know many of us have been following the evolution of both NATO and the European Union's defense identity for many years, as well as the cooperation between the two organizations, which now includes a list of um, some 74 areas of cooperation and, and growing which with, each, uh, with each year. So I think what we heard in the previous panels is that we're now looking at this broader definition of security. And President Biden talks about the US and the European Union, um, as well as NATO as natural partners. And during his trip to Europe last month, he really underscored the value of allies and partners, of the US commitment to NATO and of the European Union. So I think that's what I'd like to dig into today with our panelists and speakers, is now that we have this renewed commitment to these organizations and their respective strengths are really um, even more well-defined as we take this broader definition of security, which includes not just hard security and defense, but emerging and disruptive technologies, as Nema has said, resilience, uh, climate, a lot of things on the agenda here um, for us to work on. I think one of the other messages that President Biden put forward was the importance of standing together to sort of update the rules of the world. So I'd like to begin with your thoughts on sort of the state of the NATO EU and US EU relations at this point in time. What's going well, um, if you will, almost like a, a bit of a report card on the state of those relationships and where maybe do we need a little bit of a different focus? Uh, and then finally, if you have any indications as to how we prioritize these many areas of cooperation, I think that would launch us into um, then a deeper discussion of, of these respective areas. So Secretary Fries, uh, let me begin with you. Thank you, Rachel. I'm very pleased to, to be with you this morning and to take part in this new um, EU Washington Defense Forum. Uh, I would like to make uh, three short remarks following, what, following your presentation. Uh, the first one, as you said, the new US administration has brought a, a big change uh, to our relations in the field of security and defense. Uh, because Washington does not see uh, any longer the EU as an enemy but as it has always been, a partner, an ally, and a friend. And at the most recent EU-US summit uh, two weeks ago, leaders on both sides recognize a contribution that EU security and defense initiatives can make to both European and transatlantic security. We know on this side of the Atlantic that the, e that the US will value the transatlantic relationship if it brings value to them. So the more EU member states invest and cooperate on defense, I think the stronger and more reliable the European member states become for the US partner. Uh, 
And as you said, the recent uh, invitation to the US to participate in the PESCO project on military mobility is very good news. It constitutes an important step forward in strengthening EU-US defense cooperation. And I think that more than ever, it is time for security and defense to become an integral part of the EU-US relationship. And following this summit, I think now we will work on two concrete issues. First, the, our leaders agreed to launch a dedicated dialogue on security and defense and pursue closer cooperation in this field. So we are looking forward to discussing with uh, the US ways to counter common challenges, such as China's growing geopolitical ambitions, hybrid and cyber uh, threats, including disinformation, terrorism, protection of critical infrastructure, or climate change. And the other point is that the leaders uh, agreed to work towards an administrative arrangement of the US with the European Defense Agency. On our side, we are committed to starting discussions on this matter as soon as possible, particularly on the modalities and conditions for mutually beneficial cooperation in this framework. My second remark is on NATO-EU partnership. Uh, I think this partnership has reached unprecedented, unprecedented levels. And uh, in their summit communique uh, two weeks ago, the leaders, NATO leaders, um, uh, mentioned that the EU remains a unique and essential partner for NATO. Politically, our dialogue has intensified over recent years at all levels. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg participated for the first time in a meeting of the College of EU Commissioners last December. And then he addressed the EU leaders at the European Council last February. He's a regular guest at the meetings of the EU defense ministers. And, uh, and on our side, uh, the EU uh, High Representative Borrell is regularly invited to meetings of NATO foreign and defense ministers. In terms of capability development, we see also a positive momentum. EU defense initiatives are designed to ensure coherence with NATO and to contribute to a more balanced transatlantic burden sharing. And indeed, 38 out of 46, 46 PESCO projects respond to NATO priorities. On our side, we are ready to do more. On Thursday, for instance, I will brief ambassadors from the EU Political and Security Committee and North Atlantic Council on China. More generally, we are open to work on a new joint declaration between NATO and the EU. As you know, we have already two joint statements and on the uh, ES side, uh, and I think it's shared by many member states, we are ready to launch such exercise. And we count on the new US administration's active support to further strengthen our strategic partnership with NATO. My third and final remark, very short, the EU and NATO are currently working on two separate reflection processes. The EU is working on the strategic compass, which will be adopted in March 2022, while NATO is working on a strategic concept, which will be adopted in the NATO summit in Madrid in July 2022. So we need, obviously, coherence between the two processes. And this coherence, of course, will happen in the respect of the decision-making autonomy of each organization. I think that with a strategic compass, I'm sure that the European contribution to the alliance, to the alliance, so its European pillar, will be strengthened because we have always been convinced that a stronger EU and a stronger NATO go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Fries. That reminder about the importance of coherence and alignment at the strategic level, I think, is, is something we should keep in mind. Of course, EU uh, military cooperation and NATO military cooperation have been happening at that grassroots level for some time, but that top level alignment is so vital as well. Um, so, uh, turning to Secretary Lampret, uh, your country will be taking over the presidency of the EU in just a few days. So, I'd welcome your views on how you see the state of US EU and, and NATO EU cooperation just now. 
Uh, thank you. Let me start by thanking you for inviting me to this distinguished panel and giving me an opportunity to say something about our priorities. As you said, in a few days, we are taking over the Council of the European Union. And I think our priorities closely align with what we will discuss, with what we discuss in the next 30 minutes. Um, the relationship between the United States and Slovenia since our independence 30 years ago has traditionally been good. But nevertheless, we are investing heavily to make it better and to make it stronger, much stronger, may I dare say so. We see the US as an important strategic partner, as one of our most important allies. Slovenia, as 20 other countries, are an ally in NATO and a member, states, member state of the European Union. So this event could not be more timely for us since it is happening right now, a few days before we take the helm of the Council of EU. The slogan of our presidency is Together, Resilient and Europe. And it does reflect our priorities and importance of building a better, safer and greener future for all of us together as a team. This also relates to close cooperation between EU and NATO which is an integral part of our presidency agenda and one, may I, dare, may I dare say so, our first priority. Historically, the EU-NATO cooperation, from our point of view, brought tangible results, especially in the joint operations in the Western Balkans, where benefit of the two organizations working hand in hand could be spotted from afar. The region, Western Balkans remains of a great strategic importance to the Alliance as well as the EU. Unfortunately, it remains in the yoke of outside malign influence, interference, ever brewing nationalist tensions and unresolved issues from the past. Slovenia remains firmly committed to the long-term security and stability for the region. That is the reason we believe it is high time for all of us to step up and do more in terms of supporting Western Balkan countries in moving closer to the full Euro-Atlantic integration. This is the second priority for our presidency. One of the most significant messages of this year's NATO summit was the importance of combining military with other instruments of power. While military strength is the raison d'etre of NATO, it is by itself not sufficient to address increasingly complex challenges like hybrid threats and the impact of climate change on security and defense. Climate change sits high on the agenda in the EU and in Slovenia. We believe the defense sector can also play an important role in the ambitious European Green Deal initiative. That's why energy efficiency of the defense sector is our third priority. This year, it will be again time for reflection in both organizations, since we will start on a process of setting strategic frameworks for the future in the two organizations. Considering this, it is important to align NATO strategic concept and the EU strategic compass, and with that, strengthen the partnership that has no alternative. <laughs> I'm glad that both Secretary General Stoltenberg and High Representative Boril also share this view, clearly re reflected in their co-signed letter in response to the Food for Thought paper, <coughs> EU-NATO cooperation, time to achieve full complementarity, prepared by Germany and the Netherlands, which was supported by many allies and the EU member states, including Slovenia. This is highly welcome and promising development and best way to start our presidency of the Council of the EU. I was also pleased to see that the invitation to the US to join the PESCO military mobility project that was discussed before was recognized at the recent EU-US summit as a vital step towards strengthening our transatlantic relations on defense. Military mobility is an excellent example of how EU-NATO cooperation can be effective in practice. It shows that a stronger and more capable EU also means a stronger NATO. And a robust NATO means stronger transatlantic bond between the US and European allies like Slovenia. Strengthening resilience is another important area where we should look for new 
and build on existing synergies between EU, NATO, and the US. It requires civil military coordination, a whole of government, or even 360 degree whole of society approach. This is why it is crucial that we all cooperate as like-minded and equal partners. We share the same values that give us the strong foundations on which we can expand joint efforts in every area that is concerned to us all and span the traditional geography. Let me stop here and thank you for your close attention. Thank you, State Secretary. It's wonderful and refreshing to hear how much alignment there is with Slovenia's presidency agenda and things that are being pursued at an EU and NATO level. Um, you know, we've got the US-EU Energy Council in particular that will align well with your third priority. So finally, I want to turn to, to James. James, it's nice to see you again, and thank you for joining us. I mean, you really sit uh, within NATO at the nexus of NATO's adaptation. Uh, with NATO 2030, but also partnerships, uh, not just with the EU, but, but with our enhanced opportunity partners and, and others across the world. So what is your view sort of on the state of, of the EU-NATO relationship, uh, but now also this burgeoning uh, US-EU arm of, of transatlantic cooperation? Great. Thanks very much, Rachel, and thanks to the conference organizers. Uh, I think it's actually a testament to how close NATO-EU cooperation is, is that actually Mr. Fries has the exact same list of high-level meetings and interactions that I was going to list. Uh, so we're actually talking off of the same speaking points without having coordinated with each other ahead of time. So I think that actually speaks to the level and depth of the cooperation that's been achieved over the last several years. Uh, I think really, especially since 2016, uh, I would say NATO EU relations have developed exponentially. Uh, and let me focus, rather than talking about some of the higher level political interactions, on some of the more practical work that we've been doing together, where I think it adds value for the two organizations. Uh, I think we can really point in the last couple of years to concrete deliberal deliverables on things like the structured dialogue on military mobility, cooperation countering hybrid and cyber threats, and disinformation in the pandemic. Uh, NATO EU cooperation there was crucial in the past over the past year and a half, uh, and then also common support to partner countries. I just mentioned Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republic of Moldova, Ukraine, Jordan, Tunisia. Uh, all of those are areas where NATO and the EU have a deep dialogue about how we are jointly trying to work together with these countries to help them with the security challenges they face. And I think that the political oversight and the political direction that we get is fantastic. We must have that. But I think it's also interesting to look at sort of where is this being implemented in, in practice. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, where we we might go in the future. Uh, I think that, as Mr. Fries mentioned, uh, NATO has highlighted the EU as a unique and essential par partner. Uh, it's the only country that gets, or excuse me, the only organization that gets that treatment in our communique. And so uh, I think uh, for that reason, you know, we, we're looking in, uh, in a lot of ways in our new strategic concept to think about how we can coordinate with the EU strategic compass, but also how do we build this cooperation with the EU into our thinking for the new strategic concept, our updated strategic concept. And I don't think we really have a choice on this. The two organizations are tasked to uh, work on the prosperity, security, and uh, democratic freedom of their countries. And so we share missions. And so it's important for us to make sure that we're working together in that regard. Um, what do we need to get right in these two documents? And, and what are the areas uh, in, a, in an era of new geostrategic competition, strategic competition? Uh, I think there are four areas that NATO and the EU need to get right in terms of our cooperation if we are to succeed. Uh, the first is military mobility. Uh, it's been discussed at length, I think, in this conference, so I won't go into the details there, but we have to be able to ensure security and stability in the European continent. That's the prerequisite for doing everything else that we do. The second area that we really need to get right is societal resilience. 
Uh, NATO allies uh, agreed a set of baseline requirements and also agreed that resilience is now going to be part of NATO's assessment and planning process. But NATO looks at only a very small section of that resilience. Obviously, the European Union and the member states have responsibility for many different areas. But we've got to clarify what is it that NATO is looking at and responsible for, what is the EU looking at and responsible for. But again, that gets to stability, security, and prosperity in our societies. We've got to get that right looking forward. The third area where I think we need to get the relationship right is emerging and disruptive technologies and space. And again, that's been touched on in the conference earlier, but we're looking at a period where NATO and the EU are both going to be called upon by their member, respective member states to look at the development of new capabilities, the development of new international norms, the development of new standards, and potentially even confidence and security building and arms control measures. And NATO has certain uh, expertise and a certain view on this and certain area where NATO will be active. And the EU also clearly has a very important role to play here uh, and, and will play a leading role in, in many areas. So we've got to get the relationship right in looking at those areas. And then finally, the fourth area that I would highlight where uh, we've already made some progress, but I think we need to continue to work on this, and that is capacity building in countries of common concern. So I mentioned Bosnia-Herzegovina, Republic of Moldova, Ukraine, Jordan, Tunisia, we're already doing work there. But I think as we look at challenges to security and stability in the areas of, of concern to both NATO and the EU, we've got to get that relationship right and figure out what are the uh, unique components and uh, maybe complementary components that the two organizations bring together uh, to try and help tackle some of the challenges that we face. Uh, let me finish there and uh, look forward to the discussion and some questions. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, James. That was a fantastic overview, and I particularly appreciated those four areas that you highlighted, and I'd, I'd like to dive into those in, in just a moment here. Um, I do want to ask sort of a macro-level question, though. As I was going through the various communiques from um, the summits, uh, it, it didn't escape me the number of working groups and councils that were, were set up. So, um, Charles, you mentioned the dedicated dialogue on security and defense. Um, but we also have dialogues on Russia and cyber and migration and a number of the areas that, that you know, others have highlighted on, on hybrid and disinformation. Um, those are things that conversations that already happen to some extent in a NATO context. So as we set up these new architectures, how do we make sure that we're not almost I don't want to make this a zero-sum game or, or set up the usual caveats, but how do we make sure that we're not detracting from, from the good things you laid out that are already going on in terms of NATO-EU cooperation, even as we move down this path of U.S.-EU cooperation? Secretary Fries, may I begin with you, please? Yes, thank you, Rachel. Um, I, I fully agree with your with the question that you've just asked about the, the risk of uh, duplication, but I think it's not at all the case. Uh, I think we have this uh, very strong partnership uh, with NATO, and uh, James Mackey has, uh, uh, has, has presented a list of four uh, possible areas of uh, um, more cooperation between our two organizations. I, I can uh, uh, approve uh, the whole list and, and because uh, we have the same talking points to a certain extent. Um, uh, but uh, I think this very strong cooperation between the EU and NATO, it's not a, 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 in contradiction with the fact that the EU wants to develop its own dialogue with some key, region, with some key players. And of course, the US for us uh, as a country is a, is a most important strategic partner. And so uh, knowing the fact that the EU has developed uh, over the recent years its own defense initiatives, it makes sense, uh, you know, to have a direct dialogue on security and defense issues with Washington. Uh, that means that uh, we, and I think the U.S. administration now has understood that when when we when uh, the U.S. want to address uh, security issues uh, related to Europe, of course we have to. Do, uh, the U.S. have to do that uh, uh, with NATO, but also they can talk directly to us. Because when we talk about PESCO, when we talk about a European Defence Fund, when we talk about military mobility project, when we talk about strategic compass, when we talk about what we want to do in terms of hybrid and cyber policies, I think uh, this direct dialogue uh, between Brussels and Washington uh, can, can, um, 
can bring added value. Uh, the U.S. have understood that it is in their interest to have a stronger and more reliable Europe because the U.S., we know this by heart, are very much now focused on Asia. So the more Europe is responsible, a credible security provider, the more it is in, in the interest of the United States. So to establish this dialogue, we don't know at this stage the modalities of this dialogue because we have not discussed this in detail with the US administration. We will do that in the coming months. Uh, but I think we have already such dialogue with Canada, with Norway. And so it makes sense to have uh, a, a dedicated dialogue on security and defense with the US administration. But here again, it's not in contradiction with the partnership we have between the two organizations. Sometimes we can go further with a specific country like the US, and sometimes we will uh, do different things with NATO. But we have uh, one uh, single policy, and of course we, we, we would like to, to move forward with the United States. Uh, I think the US interest in our EU defense initiatives, uh, I think it's the best illustration of the interest uh, represented by what we have been doing over the last years. Thank you. That's an excellent answer. James, any concerns from the NATO side as, as you watch this, or is, is this something that NATO is, is ready to dive into and, and accept? No, actually, uh, to be honest, we're we're uh, okay with this, and the reason that I can say we're we're okay with this is because the EU already has similar type of dialogue with countries like Canada and Norway, uh, both of which are, are NATO member states, and so uh, we think it's perfectly normal for the EU to also want to reach out on a bilateral level. Uh, I think we need to talk about where does this make sense, and 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 you know where does the dialogue go, you know the depth of the dialogue in different areas. Uh, just my personal view and sort of my our teams thinking here is that things, if you're talking about things like health, climate, trade and technology, promotion of the rules-based order, especially uh, in terms of trade, uh, I think those are probably areas that would be very fruitful for a US-EU bilateral dialogue. And then when we talk about things like uh, secure development of security and defense capabilities, crisis management, military operations, exchange of classified information, and arms control, those things probably fall more into a NATO-EU dialogue. Uh, obviously, this is still a work in progress, and that's, as I said, just my own personal view, uh, at least from within our team of where it makes the most sense. But I, I don't think uh, we, we lack for challenges here. Uh, we, we, we can uh, have it all, uh, we must do it all, and, and there's no real competition of forums here. And because as I said, the EU already has a robust dialogue bilaterally with a number of our allies already. Excellent. Um, Secretary Lempert, you, in outlining the priorities of, of your presidency, mentioned Western Balkans, and, and James also mentioned the importance of improving our capacity building and our alignment in that regard. Did, does Slovenia, as a, as, either as a NATO member or as you assume the presidency, have any specific uh, lines of effort in, in this regard? Um, first... As I said before, this is the second time that we will be taking over the presidency of the Council of the EU. Even the first time, we were trying to underline the importance of Western Balkans becoming part of, of the Euro-Atlantic integration, the way we said, because I think that the process of joining to NATO and the EU for some partners is a connected process, and we, we are trying to help them with both. NATO as such means the security and stability of a partner country, especially in the region. Uh, the EU membership is the economic stability and prosperity of its inhabitants. So one cannot go without, without the other. But may I also add to the discussion that, that we just heard a few minutes ago, maybe to, to, to put a view of a, of a different, of a, of a different uh, member state. This uh, danger or, or a challenge of a possible duplication of efforts of the two organizations, I think what for a member state, there are two important things when we are looking at NATO or the EU, EU on the security and the defense. One thing is, of course, is building up capabilities. The second is the operations. And, com and combining that with the Western Balkans, it's an excellent of ex of example of the two organizations working together is the operation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. After NATO fi finalized its operation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the EU took over in the Berlin Plus uh, arrangement. So that is working perfectly. With regards to the capability development, it is on to the member state to avoid the duplication because 
For Slovenia, for example, our priorities in the capability development are the capability targets discussed and, and set in the, in, the, in the framework of the alliance. But building these capabilities, we will rely on the assistance or working together with other European member states. And of course, on the, all the mechanisms and funds that are available at the EU. So I think there's always a challenge of duplication, but it's, it's all the options that are available sort of can prevent the, the, the duplication that was discussed. Back to the Western Balkans, why we are, we are again putting the, 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 the region on the map, or we're trying to put the region on the map. There are different countries in the region, and they're in different status on, of conversation and their efforts to, to join the two organizations. We see a very successful story with regards to Montenegro and very successful story and the, all the comprom political compromises made with regards to North Macedonia. So we see there are opening questions still with regards to Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we will try to do whatever it takes to move the process forward with regard to the political dialogue, but also with regards how the two organizations can help them with security, stability, and also the long-term development. Thank you, and thank you for weighing in on both questions. I, I really was reassured by the statistic that 38 out of the 46 PESCO projects respond to NATO. There had been a concern at one point that, you know, that list of NATO capability shortfalls just kept growing and there wasn't really any progress. So I think that's very positive that there's, that there's this development in that direction where we're kind of using this collective pressure to achieve the priorities of both organizations. Uh, we're quickly running out of time, but I would be um, not doing my duty with our audience if I didn't throw out a question on emerging and disruptive technologies. I think most of our listeners are know quite a bit about uh, US-EU cooperation on military mobility um, and equally on, on resilience, uh, because there's quite a bit of that in the communique. Um, the newer area to me and the broader area is emerging and disrupt, disruptive technologies. And we've seen this talked about alternatively as an opportunity and a threat. And NATO is, is talking about cooperation with the EU um, and individual allies, both on you know, retaining the competitive edge through cooperation on innovation, but also trying to protect these critical technologies. As a final word, um, maybe starting starting with you, um, Secretary Fries again, how do you see, what, what should NATO prioritize in terms of its cooperation, uh, or what should NATO and the EU prioritize in terms of their cooperation on emerging tech and disruptive technologies, uh, recognizing that they each bring different um, advantages and, and strengths to the table? Thank you for this question, because it's it's typically one of the main uh, subjects that we will have to discuss with NATO in the coming weeks and coming months, uh, If we particularly if we want to elaborate a, a new joint statement between the two organizations. I think EDTs, emerging and disruptive technologies, are obviously a subject where our two organizations uh, should work more together. As you know, the EU uh, is a very powerful uh, norms setter. Uh, the, the one of the uh, added value of the EU, one, one of the main um, uh, originalities of the EU is that the EU uh, uh, elaborates and, and uh, sets uh, standards, uh, norms, and, and of course in uh, uh, the area of artificial intelligence, 5G, and uh, other uh, EDTs, uh, it's obvious that the uh, EU is moving forward with its uh, own agenda, the digital agenda, the, 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 uh, the uh, digital transition agenda pushed by the European Commission and, and of course, supported by the member states. So here we, have, we see uh, we need to work more with NATO in order to avoid any kind of uh, duplication. Uh, we, we, we need to, to, to exchange more with NATO, and that's why I think the subject of EDTs should be on the list of uh, the future, of a possible future joint statement. And I think uh, James uh, mentioned that very clearly. That was his third uh, proposal uh, to, to speak more uh, between NATO and the EU about EDTs and space. Here, I think it's perfectly uh, one subject for the, for the future between our two organizations. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I fear, despite my, my desire to hear from our other two panelists, I can see the red timer telling me I've got zero time. And actually, our next panel is about spending better for future capabilities. So I think that's a nice segue, actually, on emerging and disruptive technologies, um, because certainly what we want to see is, is a collective effort uh, from both sides of the Atlantic and spending better, particularly in this cutting edge area of emerging and disruptive technologies. So with thanks to our panelists for your great interventions and responsiveness to my questions. Thank you for your time, and, and let's hope this agenda continues to deliver for both our organizations. Thank you, Rachel, so much for this segue to our next topic. So, so much of what we have discussed these last two days has focused on big picture policy channels. Uh, challenge uh, transatlantic security initiatives from Africa and Asia to Russia. But what about paying for those initiatives? For our final session here at the Security Defense Summit, we take a closer look at how EU and US allies could pursue deeper cooperation on defense capabilities. How can we spend better on defense and make sure we invest into right capabilities for the future? How can the EU help its member states to spend better and save by reducing the fragmentation in European defense markets? How do we promote transatlantic defense industrial cooperation and build greater resilience into our defense supply chain? To lead us through a conversation with chief scientist for the US Air Force, Dr. Victoria Kalman, and security and science editor for the European Union Institute for Security Studies, Daniel Fiet, is resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Mackenzie Eaglin. But before that, a reminder once again, if you'd like to ask a question to our panelists, you can do so by using Ask Live Questions here button at the center of the page. You can also participate in the discussion online by using the hashtag EU Defense on social media. That's EU Defense with an S. And some of those questions will be debated further after our forum. But now our last panel, Mackenzie, for our final panel of the day, the stage and the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome everyone to the final panel where we know that strategy wears a dollar sign. So budgets matter, people matter and investments matter and the choices made behind them. So welcome to the panel on spending better for future capabilities. I'm pleased to be the moderator this afternoon with two distinguished panelists. As you heard, Dr. Victoria Coleman is the chief scientist of the United States Air Force an expert in AI and microelectronics and a founder of DARPA's Microsystems Exploratory Council and a member of the Defense Science Board. I'm also happy to welcome Dr. Daniel Fiat, the Security and Defense Editor at the EU Institute for Security Studies. He is a prolific writer on European defense policy, the common security and defense policy of Europe, industrial issues and other threats. I welcome you both here today. Good afternoon. Well, we're going to jump into our questions. We also want to, of course, welcome throughout the session today audience participation, uh, as you've been noted, to, to send those through to us. And I'll, we'll try to get to them at the end of our very brief concluding event um, for today. Dr. Coleman, I'd like to begin with you. Obviously, this panel is focused on how the U.S. and Europe are approaching uh, not only defense investments, but future capabilities. In recent years, we've seen not just only in the U.S., but around the world, uh, higher investments in technological innovation. And a lot of this is occurring in the private sector. What we see here in the US is a flipping uh, of the coin, where the federal government is no longer the lead innovator. It must, uh, no, excuse me, no longer the lead inventor. It actually must innovate with existing technologies that are often provided by the commercial sector, whereas in five decades ago, for example, the reverse was true. I'd argue the department has struggled to take full advantage of innovation, not that it hasn't in certain select cases, which I'd be happy to talk about with you. How do you recommend the Pentagon and our partners in Europe improve collaboration with the private sector going forward? Thank you. Um, you know, sometimes um, it, it, it feels like there is a, um, there's a border between the East Coast and the West Coast in the United States. I, uh, you know, I spent most of my career in the Silicon Valley, and uh, 
um, now in Washington, um, I see that uh, really clearly. And it's kind of interesting because as you as you noted, uh, it used to be the case that um, you know most innovation really started uh, with uh, investments from the department. So you know if if you think about um, you know, internet, uh, GPS, um, even frankly um, vaccines. So the um, you know the the. Uh, messenger RNA vaccines that uh, we enjoy today and are helping us defeat the, um, the coronavirus, um, they actually came from Department of Defense uh, investments. Um, primarily in my previous agency, for which I'm really proud, um, uh, DARPA. But the world has, uh, has changed a lot. Um, and it has changed a lot because uh, not because we started investing less uh, inside of the department or inside of the defense industrial base in the United States, but because the world outside started investing a lot more. Um, so now, you know, for almost like for every dollar that we spend uh, in science and technology inside of the department, nine dollars is spent outside by the commercial sector, the private sector. So for us now, the challenge is how do we make sure that we tap into that investment, that brilliance of the world outside and bring that uh, to bear for the mission that we have to execute on? Um, and there are many, um, you know, many, many challenges and opportunities that we have. Um, some things that I, I, I think are making, um, are making the links uh, better are, for example, the AFWORKS program inside of the Department of the Air Force, which started a couple of years ago, uh, with the, 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 the specific mission to make um, collaboration with the private sector, in particular smaller businesses, much more um, possible. And we did that by really opening up the aperture and uh, removing any restrictions in the topic areas, for example, that a company could bid in for our small business innovation and research program. And every year we fund thousands of companies to bring their technologies back um, into, the, uh, into the department. We feel that we need to continue doing that because it's not just about, um, you know, what we do is who do we build it with and how do we build it? We recognize that. And, you know, I have to say that that, of course, um, um, extends to our partnerships uh, across the water with our uh, partners in Europe. Uh, there are many specific areas. Some of them have been spoken about uh, already today. Uh, there are others um, that are, you know, equally obvious areas like microelectronics, for example, where, um, you know, by standing together, we can make um, a real big difference in our ability to, to maintain essential supply chains for both economic security and national security for ourselves here in the United States, as well as our allies in Europe. Um, hopefully that gives you a sense yes. for the current situation. Indeed. Indeed. And all of the services have, have something here in the U.S. similar to AFWorks, which I think is is remarkable. And and that's right. Everything from pantyhose to plastic bags to the email to the computer mouse were all invented somewhere resident in the Defense Department all the way up to Siri and your iPhone. Uh, but again, that's no longer the case. The department's no longer the lead inventor. So it is a new dawn, a new era. And I think there's a lot to be learned. Uh, but But exciting developments ahead. Mm -hmm. Dr. Faya, I know that you shared a concern of mine and others here in the U.S. that, you know, early on in the pandemic that uh, defense investments and overall spending and budgets could fall uh, across uh, Europe. And we, we choose, you know, are worried still, I think, about that trend here in the U.S. as we take on massive amounts of debt and invest in priorities other than defense. But What's your what's your take now uh, about a year and a half in? How have Europe's defense budgets weathered the pandemic, and what does that tell you about burden sharing going forward? And if you could just quickly add, you know, maybe six months to a year from now, what the U.S. can further do to aid those efforts? 
Yeah, uh, th thanks very much, uh, uh, Mackenzie. Uh, it's a real pleasure, actually, uh, to be here. Thanks to CSIS uh, and the EU delegation to the US uh, for the invitation. Uh, and also great to be sharing a, a platform with uh, Dr. Coleman. Now, I think this is um, the question of budgets and economic health a bit more generally is going to, uh, maybe not in the short term, but certainly over the longer term, uh, play on um, this political commitment to invest more in capabilities uh, and uh, in emerging defense uh, technologies as well. What seems to be the case so far uh, is that the defense budgets have tended to be kind of protected or safeguarded from uh, what seems to be uh, the kind of economic storms that have um, uh, that have picked up uh, because of the pandemic. Um, I think we can try to explain this um, uh, very simplistically, which is that uh, unlike the experiences back in, in the 2008 economic crisis, uh, today the threat perception for Europeans uh, has changed drastically. So what we see at least uh, a few months into the pandemic, a year and a bit actually uh, into, the, into the pandemic, uh, is that defence budgets seem to be holding off in Europe, which is a great thing. Uh, the question, of course, now is what is the sustainability for that um, commitment uh, as uh, we see the potential economic fallout uh, hit European economies? We know from all of the scientific studies and even from um, uh, news feeds, media, et cetera, that, you know, when governments want to um, uh, protect money, uh, keep their budgets in order, they go after the after defense first. And even within that context, they tend to go for um, research and development money uh, even more. Um, so we have to see over the next few months, I think, um, how that's going to develop. I remain confident that actually the threat perception facing Europeans today is so drastically different that um, defense ministries, finance ministries will also hold off. And that, by the way, is what is needed because we cannot talk about coherent defense investment, uh, investments in capabilities and technologies if it's not long term. We need that long term vision uh, for those investments. I, I share that uh, reflection in terms of, you know, pots to raid when budgets get squeezed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, ours is often readiness and then, you know, the active duty rosters. And then, as you mentioned, research and development for the longer term. Uh, but I do see a shift here in the U.S. to uh, hold on tight to those investments for the future. And in, as our chairman of the Joint Chiefs has said, budgets that bias the future. We can debate over how much they should balance that future with the current and the medium term, but that is the preference of our Pentagon leadership at this moment. So as all of you know, uh, at last week's NATO summit, members agreed to create basically a version of DARPA for NATO by 2023. And, you know, this is the office that helps spin off a lot of the technological innovations that we've been talking about here this morning and inventions. Um, during President Biden's meeting with the EU, a similar Joint Trade and Technology Council was announced to address the global shortage of semiconductors. So what do these agreements say about the future of U.S. and EU defense collaboration? Of course, this question is for both of you. So... Maybe I'll maybe I'll go first. You know, I'm always uh, I'm always excited. Uh, first of all, to, you know, to hear the the, the debate and the um, commitment to longer term, um, you know, investments that we need to make. There's always a temptation, right, to to um, cure today's headache versus invest for curing smallpox tomorrow. <laughs> um, I think we, uh, for the most part, uh, we, uh, we're doing a good job here in the, in the United States in striking that balance. Um, and I'm also excited, um, really beyond measure, to see that the DARPA model continues to inspire, um, you know, transcending kind of normal... Um, usual ways of, uh, of innovating, let's say. Um, you know, DARPA has, a, has, of course, a long um, history. It's history, you know, really kind of uh, littered with success, I want to say. Um, there have been many uh, attempts to um, mimic it, to copy it in other places here in the U.S. You know, we, we tried a number of times. I know uh, the United Kingdom is trying to do something similar. Uh, what I would say is that um, the recipe works um, 
First of all, because, you know, DARPA operates very independently. Uh, you know, it's part of the, um, the Department of Defense, of course, but um, we, DARPA is not in the Pentagon. You know, it's, um, it's three or four miles away. There's a reason for that. You know, we really felt um, that it, uh, it needs to be able to uh, pick its own work, not work to anybody's requirements, uh, but also at the same time to have the ability to transit uh, and scale technologies that it creates right inside its customer base. So this is the one unique thing that DARPA has that perhaps it's difficult for others to, to emulate, and that is an internal um, large customer. So if you're looking to, um, you know, to scale the internet um, and you're part of the Department of Defense, you now have a huge constituency that you can go to. And if your technology works, they will uh, embrace it, they will use it, they will scale it. And that then creates, of course, an ecosystem that can continue maintaining it and growing it. So it creates this virtual cycle. And I think that has been, that has been I think, the primary challenge in other uh, instances where people try to recreate the recipe. So what I would urge people to think about is how do you, with all these new um, and the constructs that we put together, how do you make the connection with their customer base as direct uh, as you can make it? Yeah, maybe okay, maybe if I follow on, <laughs> maybe if maybe if I just uh, uh, can can add to to those points as well. I think. Uh, I mean, we, we're yet to see how uh, Diana and even the Innovation Fund on the NATO side will, will develop. And I think there are still a few more years before uh, it's up and running. And certainly, of course, given that the from the EU side, there's the European Defence Fund, um, it would also be interesting there in the EU-NATO context to make sure, again, that some of the points we heard in the last panel about avoiding duplication, coordination are also followed through. I also think what Dr. Coleman said was, was really uh, instructive. Uh, not just in terms of the the large customer base that you have, but also this um, difficulty that um, many, many defense actors face when trying to replicate DARPA, and that is about the kind of culture of innovation, which is not something you can buy and not something that you can create overnight. And at least from the EU side, uh, when you look at the European Defense Fund in particular, these are some of the challenges that will be faced by the EU as well. I mean, recently there was agreement on the Defense Fund, uh, which will be about eight billion over the next seven years. Uh, there was also agreement on the European Space program, which is um, uh, up to the order of about 15 billion. Now, one of the clever things, at least uh, from the EU side that's being done, is to try and harness the innovation um, um, potential between these uh, different funds. And when you add on to that civil research as well, you're already talking in the regions of about 120 billion euros uh, over seven years. Now, that's money. Um, we can quote figures all day long, but the real challenge will be, how do you make sure that you have technology visions, technology roadmap? in place um, to ensure that when you're investing money, when you're trying to unlock innovation, that it actually leads to um, capabilities, uh, technological possibilities as well. In Europe, we may, we may have a different kind of risk culture even, I think. Uh, whereas in America, you know, there is this idea of funding failure as a kind of ethos. In Europe, we're still playing catch up on that. Um, you need money for that. You need a, a customer who's willing to also invest uh, in funding failure. But it's, uh, again, cultural. And maybe just to, to raise um, another point as well, and that is that the risk is that we become a bit too tech-centric when we discuss um, EDTs um, or even capabilities. And at least I think one of the big challenges for NATO and even for the EU as well as it starts off on this road is how do you keep in mind the needs of the end users, right? At the end of the day, capabilities and technologies should be at the service of our end users. And uh, we yet to coherently start that dialogue. I think the strategic compass in the EU side might help uh, with this um, uh, um, approach, but it is the long-term goal here that we're using capabilities, investing them for the purposes of end users to, to improve capability and, and obviously the, the capacity to act uh, overall uh, in defense. Well, thanks for giving us a little more credit, I think, than we deserve here in the U.S. for an ethos of failure. You know, I, I agree we're, all parties are trying to do that better, the executive branch and the legislative branch. Um, yes, DARPA has always had that culture. 
Uh, but now sort of spreading it across the services in the department, you know, Congress has, there's a say do gap between, you know, the acknowledgement of the need to fail and fail fast and fail elegantly. And then they're getting upset and yanking funds when, you know, we actually do fail. So, um, but I think there is progress being, being made. And I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, and and this, these are real dollars. And there, I totally agree on the risk of getting too technocentric. Uh, we still need trucks, meaning the proverbial truck. We still need ships, aircraft, and vehicles to to innovate on, uh, you know, using like some legacy systems, for example, or some new capabilities to to innovate them. As you note, for the end user, the Army, the U.S. Army has actually done that here in the United States, where they put um, their next generation uh, VR like goggles. You know, they put coders in the field next to soldiers and in real time updated it to, to get a better product. And it's turned out to be a remarkable contribution. And I think we all all need to do more of that, to your point. So then let's get a little specific here, not on dollars, but on like actual tangible examples of emerging technology or capabilities where the U.S. and EU can cooperate in the next, say, one to five years. So, for example, we know two of our services here in the U.S., they're working on next generation air dominance capabilities, the Air Force and the Navy, for example. I know that France, uh, the U.K. and Germany, and I believe Spain are working on their future combat air systems, which may include a manned fighter. Uh, both this question's for one or both of you. You know, talk about interoperability opportunities and specific um, uh, emergent capabilities that the, the two blocks can work together on. Well, maybe if I uh, if I take a first stab at that, uh, you know, I remember um, our previous um, chief of staff at the Air Force, uh, John Goldfein, he used to talk about trucks and highways. So his trucks were airplanes, um, and his highways you know, were the networks that these airplanes used uh, used to uh, to execute their missions. So um, he didn't want any more trucks. He wanted highways because he couldn't move his trucks around. And I, you know, I think he, he had it right. Um, you know, we, you know, w when we look at, uh, at our posture inside of the Department of the Air Force, you know, certainly thinking about uh, what the aircraft mix we will need in order to pursue the missions that we all, you know, are planning for, um, you know, that's one kind of set of discussions. And, you know, you will have heard um, uh, the chief um, the, speaking about four plus one, uh, they, you know, uh, necking down uh, the um, the kinds of aircraft that we have. Um, but really, the the trick is how do you get all these assets to work together when you actually need to go execute a mission? So that's where our advanced battle management system uh, comes in. So the AU ABMS program. Um, is is an effort to uh, really connect all these assets uh, across all classification domains um, and really break down kind of the insularities that uh, persist in all of our you know in all the services um, certainly within the Air Force you know it's it's well known that uh, an F twenty two cannot speak to an F thirty five today so one of the things that we are putting a great deal of emphasis in, as well as making sure that we have the right asset mix, you know, to take on the missions that we're asked to uh, to support. We're also going to be able to have the connectivity, the networking, um, the ability, you know, to put data in the right place at the right time in the right form for the decision maker to make decisions to move forward the um, uh, the mission. And I have to say, uh, it's not straightforward. Um, you know, perhaps I think we're back, you know, at the kind of network discovery uh, era that, um, you know, DARPA so ably executed on um, when the internet was born. Um, it's, you know, it's a little different when you have, um, you know, servers appearing and disappearing, um, which is, you know, the, the context within which we have to fight um, our, our, our missions. Um, it's not like you know you can you can go to Amazon and use their cloud to fight those missions. Um, we have a lot of work ahead of us in order to figure out uh, exactly how to go about building these highways that John Goldfein used to talk about, um, and also frankly how to begin to deploy them. I mean, one thing that I'm just gonna you know get out there, and I think Mackenzie, you know, you are very familiar with this. 
uh, you know, here in the United States, we are not wanting for innovation. You know, there's a ton of innovation all over the place. What we're wanting for is the ability to translate that innovation to fill their capability. So, you know, the thing that I worry most about with most everything we do is that we're going to go create even more prototypes to add to the pile of prototypes we already have. And it's not about that. It's about capabilities. So learning how to work in a lean, you know, in a lean startup kind of way, uh, if you like, when we build a little, we test a little, we fill a little, I think that's the real challenge for us when it comes to acquisition. Right? It's changing that very long time frame, uh, decades long, that it takes us often to go from uh, innovation to deployment, take it down to months. Uh, I think that's what um, will continue testing us, and that's what we need to apply our, you know, our ingenuity, for which we're well known in our nation. Amen. I agree with that field a little. That's the part where the U.S. has been lacking in the last five years. Dr. Fyatt. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think uh, you know the, the the last point about ingenuity was was a good place uh, for me to, to to take off from. I mean, if you look at some of the areas that the EU is already trying to invest in in terms of capabilities, uh, some of them are really familiar. Uh, so drones uh, and drone technology, space tech, um, unmanned ground vehicles, uh, high precision strike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think, however, though, that uh, probably in the context of uh, EU-US dialogue, we should probably try to start off at a rather basic level. I mean, I think already Dr. Coleman uh, put her finger on something really important, which is um, interoperability between forces. Uh, and I, I think uh, also, Mackenzie, you, re you referenced um, FCAS and other projects that are on the horizon. And it will be, of course, crucial to ensure uh, that there is um, a level of, of operational interoperability there uh, between uh, the US and European armed forces. And um, governments and militaries in Europe are, are fully aware of that. I think, however, that maybe uh, one area that um, requires a bit more dialogue, however, is actually fully understanding uh, the technological um, realm uh, or dimension that we're in right now. I mean, I'm not too convinced uh, that many of Europe's uh, armed forces or military firstly are sold on the idea that um, we're now heading towards a kind of EDT revolution. And secondly, I would worry that the pace of that um, uh, you know, disruption that we see in technology will not be easily translated actually into the skills and the usability of these technologies in armed forces. And this uh, you know, also touches base on some of these um, core issues, such as how do we deal as militaries uh, with the data deluge that we're all facing? So so many different sources of data, not necessarily the capacity to actually uh, use that data in an in a operational and effective way. And of course, again, to come back to my earlier point about not being too tech-centric, we've not got to forget the human dimension in all of this. And the point about skills uh, and also training um, armed force personnel uh, in Europe and across the transatlantic space to actually be able to use some of these EDTs in an effective way on the battlefield is actually going to be one of the core challenges. And, um, you know, it's been written about on many occasions about the so-called uh, growing uh, transatlantic technology gap um, or strategic gap. Well, when you see the rise uh, of China and you also see other actors who are able to uh, use and employ these technologies rather quickly, that is quite a danger for us all, this transatlantic uh, gap. So we better find uh, coherent strategies of developing uh, or closing that gap, as it were, so that armed forces understand fully what we mean, all of those tech nerds, what we mean when we talk about disruption, and how does it make their life better? Do they have the skills, training, and personnel to actually make it work uh, in the battle space? You know, that's something I worry about a lot, too, here in the U.S., is this... Um, overwhelming emphasis on artificial intelligence without thinking through yet enough of the sort of back office, behind the scenes, back door, you know, basically you're, it's only as good as your data. And our defense department has shown to be a very poor collector of the right data. We love to dump all the good data uh, and then securing the right data. So yeah, that, that, that's a whole big conversation. And of course, military deception, which is active, alive and well. And I think, uh, we fall prey here in the U.S. to thinking that um, we are not subject to military deception on a regular basis when we are. Not just sort of election interference, but actual manipulation of data, whether we think that it's true, but it's not, or it's been altered and we don't know it, et cetera. 
I want to talk about space, but let's just get on to supply chains because I think this is of interest to our our audience, not just you know what COVID has done in sort of exposing uh, not just the vulnerability and fragility of supply chains, but for many um, U.S. and EU countries, the need to onshore or reshore critical supply chains. We talked briefly earlier about semiconductors. It came up. Uh, but then we've also seen in hybrid warfare operations by a variety of actors in recent years, their ability to... Um, disrupt supply chain. So uh, again, not to, you know, I'm going to put this out to both of you. We can take it, uh, feel free to answer or not, but what what are the areas of cooperation for the U.S. and the EU on supply chains, and how can we do this better, having hopefully learned from the immediate moment, or, or maybe there's still a ways to go? What are your thoughts? So if, if, I, if I jump in, I mean, you mentioned the magic word, Mackenzie, you said semiconductors, you know, when somebody says semiconductor, I always wake up. <laughs> I uh, uh, and this is something that I've worked on uh, for for many years, uh, both in my private capacity, but also in my capacity here in the department. Um, and it's of course deeply uh, meaningful because you know there ain't a lot that we do uh, in the environmental defense that does not rely on a fabric of microelectronics and semiconductors. It's also uh, plain painfully obvious, obvious that we've left. We let manufacturing of semiconductors slip away from us, um, and we've put ourselves in a position where um, we are really vulnerable to uh, supply chain disruptions. So, you know, today the United States has 12% of global semiconductor manufacturing here at home. Uh, but if you look at our consumption, uh, we consume over easily over 20% of worldwide production of leading edge semiconductors. Our partners in Europe consume about 25%. So put together 45% of the global market for semiconductors is, uh, is consumed here in the United States and by our allies in Europe. But we only make 12% today. And if we don't do anything, 10 years out will be 9%. So, you know, it really is, I think, um, it borders on a national emergency. Uh, for us and our allies to be able to reclaim those supply chains. And, you know, one thing that I think is really important, it's not just about supply chains. It's also about keeping competency here at home. It's about having good jobs for people that go and invest a lot of time and money in their education. Um, and it, it's about, in, in many ways, rebuilding our industrial commons here at home and in Europe. Um, so a really, really important topic. And I know we're running short of time, so I will, um, I will stop here. Dr. Fayette, you get the last word. Fair, thank you very much. It's very, very difficult actually to build on what Dr. Coleman just said, because I think uh, from a European perspective, uh, we feel exactly the same way. Um, of course, it's always difficult to try and remanage or reorganize um, um, global supply chains. But what is very, very clear is that we are dependent, especially in the semiconductors um, side of things, we're dependent not only on countries uh, beyond our shores, but also in one of the most geopolitically tense uh, environments in the world now. Uh, so it does beg a whole uh, set of questions, and not just on semiconductors, but let's also think of rare earths as well, and uh, China's uh, control of what, about up to 90% of these. Now, these are critical inputs for our defense sector. They're critical inputs uh, for the weapon systems that we use. And I think that it's only right that this is one of the core um, discussions uh, that should be had uh, between the US and the EU when it comes to their overall trade, uh, technology, and security and defense um, uh, dialogue, because I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned there. And uh, one of the core, uh, one of the great benefits, if you want to even call it this, uh, from the pandemic, and I'll end on this point, uh, is actually that it's woken Europe up from its slumber a bit, that, you know, this um, philosophy of having free, open markets under any circumstances with a just-in-time philosophy, I mean, that works for certain periods in history, but we're not in that period of history anymore. So we better adjust our strategic strategic focus on supply chains uh, uh, in that respect. Thank you. Hear, here From your lips to our civilian and defense leadership's ears, thank you both for joining me today, and thank you for CSIS for hosting the 10th annual EU Washington Defense Forum. With that, we sign off. Thank you.
Thank you, Mackenzie, and uh, thank you to our speakers from the United States, Europe, Canada, and Africa who shared their perspectives on transatlantic security and defense over the past two days. Truly stimulating conversations that will no doubt be continued during the next occasion and hopefully soon in an in-person setting as it used to be the case earlier before the pandemic. And thank you all, our viewers, our transatlantic audience, for joining us virtually and for sharing your questions and thoughts and, and your posts on social media. This forum has been funded by the European Union. I would like to thank our organizers, the European Union delegation to the United States and CSIS in Washington, D.C., and the team at B&S Europe. Next year, we look forward to you all being in person in Washington for our forum, but in the meantime, do keep the security and defense dialogue going with the hashtag EU Defense. You can also share highlights from this year's forum online from the EU in the US social channels. My name is Neme Raut. I was your host for this forum for two days and from our studio here in Tallinn, Estonia. Have a all good day.